Happy Friday afternoon, everyone. We have quorum. I'm going to call this meeting to order the Public Works Committee for February 21st, 2020. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals and the media may also be audibly and or visually recording this media. All electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. And uh, just on the live stream, if you do hear some honking, that's all the drivers on Main Street honking in support of the, uh, the teachers who are out picketing out front. Um, Madam Clerk, do you have any changes to the agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, there are changes to the agenda. <clears throat> Item 10.1, respecting the standardization of fleet equipment and parts, has been withdrawn. Item 10.4, respecting Presto adoption, has been added. Please also note that there was a typographical error in recommendation A of the report. In the first row of the chart, under the action column, July 2020 should read June 2020. We also have an added notice of motion, item 12.1, respecting Powell Park tree planting. At the request of Councillor Ferguson, we also have an added general information other business item, item 13.2, respecting a potential solution to Shadow Creek. Thank you. May have a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Electronic vote. Declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest this afternoon? Seeing none. Item four, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting for February 3rd, 2020. Councillor Whitehead. So on seven one or seven two? We're just on the approval of the pre minutes. Oh, source moved, sir. Yeah. Minutes. Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Pauls. All in favor? Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Moving on to consent item 7-1 is the waste audits and recycling in the city of Hamilton. Is there any discussion on 7-1? Councillor Collins. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was hoping Angela or someone could give a, uh, just a brief synopsis in terms of what our findings were as a result of the audits that were conducted, and then I have some questions and comments. Yep. She's just heading down. Good afternoon, everybody. So through the chair, um, as a result of the motion uh, back at the Public Works Committee in January of 2018, uh, Councillor Collins had asked Parks and Waste to audit the waste recycling containers in some of our public spaces. So in summary, uh, we looked at parks, we looked at a set of stairs, we looked at street side litter containers that you'd see out here on Main Street, and we also looked at some of the bus shelter containers. So we had an auditor uh, once in July, once in August, and once in September take a peek at uh, all of the contents in those recycling containers to try and determine the types of waste that people are throwing out in the recycling. Um, so as you would have seen in the report, uh, the results showed uh, anywhere between 36 and 72 percent contamination. And contamination, as you know, just means uh, that there are items in the container that aren't accepted in that container normally. So when we were looking at the contamination in the recycling containers, there were pet feces, there was some household garbage from car, you know, car clean out, Tim Hortons cups, some hazardous waste like batteries, there was even some aerosol cans. Uh, but in general, more material than just the containers recycling were found in those containers. So as a result of the audits, again, we did do it three months in a row, and the results were pretty similar each month. The other item to note is that we did make sure that we looked at some locations in Flamborough, in Ancaster, in Stony Creek, in Hamilton, so it wasn't uh, just located in one area. Um, and as a result, what we're planning for uh, 2020 and going forward is putting some education on those containers in the parks so um, it doesn't just look like a blue barrel and people assume that it's recycling. 
Uh, we want to clearly identify on the containers what types of items are, can, are accepted in them so that uh, people can make that right decision when they go to throw them out. The other piece we learned was there are more garbage cans that seem to be around than our recycling bins. So we wanna make sure um, in our staffed parks in the summer from May to October that the containers are paired. So when somebody walks up to dispose of an item, they're able to choose whether it should be garbage or whether it should be recycling. So that will be helpful for them as well. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And special thanks to Angela and her staff for conducting the audits. And. Um, you know, I think it's a problem we've struggled with for, for a number of years in terms of the contamination rates. And, and this came about as a result of, I received a request from my cons, one of my constituents who asked about uh, installing a recycling container at the escarpment steps. And staff's response was, well, you know, we're a little hesitant to do so because we find that with all of the recycling containers we have across the city, most of them are so contaminated that um, the, when we pick them up, those bags up, they end up going into the regular waste stream and uh, they're not diverted. So that certainly was a cause for concern and that precipitated the, uh, the request to, to undertake the audit. So I'm, I was really happy with Angela's uh, summary here in terms of, you know, we'll continue to offer recycling um, containers in certain areas across the city and of course the education campaign that she just mentioned. But I, I would like to... Um, ask and get an understanding in terms of what, what is the magic number for us to start then to expand that recycling, um, uh, the recycling containers across the city because it's common almost in all parks, right? If there's a soccer league or a baseball league, people call in to say, look, uh, you know, we're tired of our players throwing our plastic bottles or cans into the garbage can. Can you please put a recycling container here? So I understand the pause um, and, and the reluctance in the past. What number would we need to reach in terms of um, a contamination number? Is it 15%, is it 10%? Um, and then at what point in time would be, we be prepared, Mr. Chairman, through you to Angela, uh, when would we be prepared to then start expanding the recycling opportunities for people who may be in some of these high traffic areas? And when I say high traffic, I mean um, people, um, to accommodate the requests that come in on a regular basis. Uh, yep, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, right now, the acceptable contamination level at the material recycling facility is anywhere between 15 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at the containers, we're looking at a 20 percent threshold that would allow us to try to send the material through the MRF rather than just declaring it as garbage when we pick it up and putting it in that side of the truck as opposed to the recycling side. Okay. And so when we reach those percentages, and, and I think a citywide basis, and as was mentioned, this is a global issue across the city. It's not just one geographic area. When we reach that, uh, that level of participation and, and those low contamination rates, then we would, just to clarify, we'd be in a position then to contemplate then start expanding the network as it relates to recycling containers. Yep, and through the chair. So um, recommendation number C from the motion or the motion request number C that we actually didn't do as part of this report was providing operational costs to expand the program. Part of that is related to the Waste Free Ontario Act um, and just sort of the uncertainty of recycling in the next few years. And the other has to do with um, the contamination rates. So it didn't make sense for us to expand at this time, as Correct. you've noted. Um, one of the items that are pretty popular in our uh, public space recycling containers also are pet waste. So we're looking separately at trying to eliminate the pet waste that goes into those containers. So we wouldn't want pet waste included in the 20%. So I think our next steps, if we could see some success in getting down to 20% contamination in the public spaces, then we would work with parks to try to cost out the operational side to see if they were going to expand it beyond their staffed locations. Terrific. And just to follow up then, lastly, the uh, success that we have with our education campaign will flow through the Waste Audit uh, Subcommittee and then on to Public Works and to Council. Is that uh, on an ongoing basis? Is that correct? Yes. So through the Chair, uh, Waste Management Advisory Committee does we uh, meet every other month. And so our audits that will take place this spring, summer and fall, will report those results back through. And then uh, when we approach the topic of maybe being able to expand the program, we'll send it through them as well and come back to committee with the information. Terrific. Thanks again, Angela. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to Councillor Collins for the questions asked, and Angela, um, I too was uh, quite taken aback in reading the report and the amount of contamination rates, especially I was shocked to see Winona Park. Um, and interestingly enough, in all of the parks where we have containers, this is happening, but on the Red Hill Trail where there are no containers, 
There's uh, much less um, incidence of, um, well, there's no recycling containers, but there's the um, garbage containers, it's only 8.3%. So it's interesting how, how people perceive the area that they're walking through and what you know they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. So I'm, I'm certainly um, in favor of moving forward and I hope I will certainly include something in my newsletters uh, in the next little while of you know trying to educate people that just because it's not in your, at your front curb doesn't mean you aren't responsible. So we have to be sure that that message continues out there. And I also appreciate Angela mentioning because I think one of our biggest issues in the parks is pet waste. It's a huge issue. And uh, there was a company that me emailed all of us, um, I think a few days ago, if I'm not mistaken, Tuesday, and I did send that off to, to Craig and Angela um, to investigate and see if there's an opportunity to work with and, and see if they, they do come through with what they had proposed, because we did have another company we were working with, and it didn't pan out to what we were hoping for. So that would be an interesting uh, scenario as well that could help a lot going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Wayhead. It's amazing, sometimes the simplest solutions uh, hit us right in the face and we ignore them. Every place in the United States now, they're moving away from the separation of garbage to single stream and then uh, bring it to a plant where uh, automation takes over and divide the garbage. Uh, talk about convenience, you don't need to be a rocket science. I think they only have two, two uh, uh, um, garbage cans now in most uh, places I've gone through in the States. Uh, I believe one is more of a, like compost kind of material and the other is the, uh, the general garbage and it's shipped to the automated uh, uh, systems. Man, because uh, I tell you, when you look into our parks and look at uh, the frequency of our visits to empty the, the containers, which forces uh, people to put probably uh, non-recyclables into recycling uh, boxes because the other one is full. When I look between St. Thomas More School and the plaza and look at the garbage, the litany of garbage that's dropped because our garbage containers are always full uh, and, uh, and they're not picked up nearly frequently enough. So there's another simple solution that is like, let's have greater frequency on areas that we've already identified as, as uh, um, um, major garbage uh, uh, dumps uh, in regards to the, the students uh, and the transition between the plazas and the high schools. Uh, I mean, the neighbors along Upper Paradise have had more than enough patience. I've been looking for more containers along that stretch uh, because clearly the garbage is just overflowing into people's yards and onto the streets. So there's two things is I hope at some point we talked about this is we really take a look at, never mind this philosophical, let's make people responsible. We're all going to immerse system uh, uh, with the province of Ontario, so we're starting to make sure that the the actual producers of the garbage are now taking responsibility for the garbage, which, is the, is, which in fact is the right place to go. And uh, I really believe that uh, we need to start taking a look at taking the burden off of individuals and families and putting the burden where it should be, and that is on the industry itself. And, uh, and, and make it less of a science and, uh, and, and give people's quality of life back to them, as opposed to spending hours in the garage trying to figure out what goes to what container. So. Um, I want to highlight that I'll continue doing that because at least it seems to me that there's a lot more transition going to single stream. Uh, when in the you know, progressive days it was let the people do it, well nowadays it's saying look, there's a, there's a better, better um, return on um, the single stream. So we talked about continue looking at it, I'm not sure where we're at. On single stream collection. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Whitehead, there was a big push North America wide to go to single stream uh, over a decade ago. And it's been found that a lot of municipalities are now going back to dual stream because the contamination levels went through the roof. Uh, we've heard of municipalities that had 40, 50, and 60% uh, contamination levels by going to single stream because a lot of wish cycling was happening where people didn't know if this container or not or fiber was recyclable. They wished it was, so they put it in the blue cart. So it, it, that has led to really, really high contamination levels, which meant that the products that were marketed had really high contamination levels in it. And that helped contribute to what happened with the global de decline in markets and led to uh, China closing their borders to uh, imports. So uh, the problem is now international. Uh, so even the recycling material we have, we, don't, we have no guarantee uh, um, receiver of, the, of this uh, uh, recycling material. Uh, it's, creating, it's continued creating a burden 
and I'm trying to understand uh, what you're saying it, 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 they, they changed and they're going back. That's not the experience I'm seeing in the United States. So help me understand where the, is this trend taking place where they're going back from single stream back to uh, recycling, like the three streams, compost, recycling, and garbage. Because I, I believe in the States, most of the municipalities are going to two stream. Uh, through the chair, I, I, I'm not aware of municipalities in the US that are including organics in with the blue, blue box materials. Uh, but when you talk about single stream recycling, that is usually papers mixed or intermingled with containers. So um, that, has what, that has led to higher contamination rates. Our contamination rate here is a, around the 20% mark. And other municipalities that have single stream recycling, so fibers and uh, containers mixed together have 30, 40, 50 percent contamination rate, which makes it harder for the processors to separate that material out of their, um, when they are sorting through their MRF, and then can also make the end product lower quality because it has more contamination in it. Uh, one way to overcome that is to spend uh, millions of dollars on their MRF to add more automated sorting. So there are uh, optical sorters that can um, separate out more of that contamination. And what you also have to do is invest in these optical sorters so you can sort paper away from containers. Right now in our facility, we have papers and containers already sorted and separated. So that means that we don't have to invest those millions of dollars in these optical sorters for that purpose. Yeah. So I, I, um, I appreciate that, but technology has come a long way in regards to the sensors the ability to do those kinds of things. In fact, I worked in a mill where a lot of separation took place right there in front of me, with, whether it's the magnets, the, the different size screens, uh, 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 the sensors. I mean, uh, and that was just in the mining industry uh, to produce uranium. So if they can do it there, certainly we can do it on the MRF. Uh, and, and the cost of those technologies are, 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 are dropping because there's first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation. Uh, um, have you ever toured some of the major, uh, um, to the chair, the major sorting centers in, in Florida, for example, and California? Have we ever actually take a look at what sophistication they have in their own, um, where they have single stream and they have the sorting centers? Because they're, they're remarkable. I went through one and it's just incredible. Uh, th <clears throat> through the chair, I have not had the pleasure of going through a, a sorting facility in Florida. Uh, Dan McKinnon and I did tour the most advanced facility in Ontario, which is in Vaughan. Um, they had dozens and dozens of optical sorters and they do accept single stream material from the city of Toronto as well as other uh, municipal clients. Um, Knowing that the Waste Free Ontario Act is going to change the way we do things in Ontario, uh, through discussions with Council and the Waste Management Advisory Committee, it was decided that we are not going to invest millions of dollars in our MRF when we are within approximately three years of the province taking over this material. Yeah. And the province may decide very well that it is single stream. They could decide that it is dual yeah, stream. Because the economies of scale be there. No, that's a great answer. I understand the, uh, the, the business case behind it. But if you've got the economies of scale, you can make those kind of investments and have less contamination and uh, make life easier for residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And just for my, my own clarification on the public space recycling in the report, we're continuing with status quo, but we're not expanding or removing anything that's already in place, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are continuing with status quo, but we're just making sure that it's equal. Right. So in the locations where we had, had some areas that had more recycling bins versus more garbage cans, we're just pairing them up to make sure that the choice is, is there for the residents that need to use it. In continuation with what's going to come with the Waste-Free Ontario Act and looking at pet waste solutions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favour? Carried. Carried, thank you. Seven point two is um, advisory committee minutes. There is seven point two a the Hamilton Cycling Committee and seven point two b the Waste Management Advisory Committee. Um, questions on 
either of these two. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I remember emails going back and forth, and I'm not sure if it, it got resolved. Is there a council representative on the cycling committee? If there's not, I'm quite prepared to put myself on it. Madam Clerk. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, there currently Councillor Pauls does represent okay. uh, on the cycling committee, although there are two council representative positions available. Oh, I'll, so I'll only be the other one. one is filled. So, Councillor Whitehead, you're volunteering to fill to that be the second. second one so I can work with Esther. Okay. So, Madam Clerk, what do we need to do to. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, if you could please take official. a motion. Yeah. So on this issue of cycling committee membership, Councillor Pauls. Can I say something? Our meetings are usually on Wednesdays, and the last three times I couldn't go because we had GIC, the last that passed, they start at 530. So most of the time, it's either council or GIC meetings, and, and they're very That's why it's good to have two. So it's good to have two if one would want to step out. And uh, that's the problem with the cycling committee. It's on Wednesdays. So, so would you like to move a motion that yes. Councillor Whitehead be I would love that. added to the cycling committee will, as a representative? So, okay. Ms. Could we put a request in? I mean, it makes it illogical that they would have it at five o'clock on, on council night. But, well, yeah. I think it's you guys can decide that well, at yeah. committee. That would be committee business. But for yeah. right now, let's just well, we'll, add we'll, Councillor Whitehead to the committee, and then you can okay. sort that out. Yeah. So moved by Councillor Paul, seconded by Councillor Marula right. on adding Councillor Whitehead to the cycling committee. No. All in favor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Whitehead, your mic's still on. Did Sorry. You? Okay. So any further discussion on 7-2, either of those two minutes? Councillor Nan. Thank you. Through the chair on uh, the cycling committee minutes, they're under the motions on page four of the committee minutes. Um, I noticed that the committee has deferred uh, the request to purchase a National Association of City Transportation officials design guidelines and previously when this came to public works there was discussion that staff would share uh, the NACTO guidelines with the committee so that the city wouldn't be purchasing it twice. So I just wanted to see if that was actually being actioned. Thank you. I'd like to go ahead Steve. Uh, so through the chair that was part of the discussion at the last cycling uh, committee meeting and it's our understanding that by uh, sharing the uh, the, the copy that the city has, we'd be infringing upon copyrights. Uh, okay. So that's why they had deferred that decision, and you'll see in the next uh, meeting minutes uh, next month a motion to, to proceed and to purchase the NACTO guidelines. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So no further speakers. I need a mover and a seconder to receive items 7.2A and 7.2B. Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Nan. All in favor? Carried, thank you. On to public hearings and delegations. Item 8.1 is the proposed permanent closure and sale of Lang Street in Hamilton. Uh, as required under the city's bylaw number 14-204, a public meeting is required. Notice of this public meeting was provided and posted on the city of Hamilton's website. The notice advised that anyone whose lands are prejudicially affected may appear before the committee this morning or afternoon. The clerk has advised that no individuals have registered to speak to this matter. So at this time, I'm going to make a call out to speakers on the proposed permanent closure and sale of Lang Street. Are there any members of the public who wish to come forward on this matter? Seeing none, for a second time, any members of the public wishing to come forward? Seeing none, and for a third and final time on the issue of the proposed permanent closure and sale of Lang Street, any members of the public that wish to come forward? Seeing none. So I need a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. Councillor Marula? Just uh, for the record, I'm sure you're not aware of this, but this is part of the Roxborough 
uh, development and something that I've been working on for half a decade. And um, I'm, as you can see, there's not one resident here opposed to the project because we've literally changed the face of the East End over the last 20 years. And collectively with the people of Ward 4 East Hamilton, we recognize progress. And not only do we recognize progress, but we embrace it and invite it. See, a lot of people don't realize, but affordable housing was not cool 20 years ago. It really wasn't. Politically, if you weren't to a community meeting where you were proposing a, an affordable housing unit, God help you. The wrath of God would hit you square in the forehead. And I remember when I met um, my community at Rookies, which is now part of Endwell, uh, across the street from their head office, which I'm pleased that they're there. And they were there to witness the angst, the anger, the hatred of potentially a counselor supporting affordable housing in their neighborhood. Fast forward to 2019, or 20 now, I guess. I've missed a few weeks. Now suddenly, now suddenly um, everybody's kind of cool on it. I'm glad that the people of Ward 4 East Hamilton were way ahead of everyone else. And in saying that, we have this project that's before us. The, the road will be closed to be redeveloped at the expense of the developer. Um, and so we're giving this road to them so that they can develop it for us. Part of the half a billion dollar development that that neighborhood will see, which will change the face of that, as I mentioned, the East End, and incorporate um, the, the actual market rent and market value of housing in that area, which was so lacking for so many years. So we're, re we're, we're actually unghettoizing an area that I inherited, and I can't emphasize how proud I am that I'm doing that. With your help and that of previous councils, we are moving forward, and I move what's before us, and I appreciate your time, and, and that's seconded by Councillor Collins. Thank you, Councillor Marula. So to close the public meeting, yeah, moved by Councillor Marula, seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Carried. The public meeting is now closed on the report. Councillor Marula, you already spoke to the report. Are there, is there any other discussion on the report? Councillor Marula? I'll move it, seconded by Councillor Collins. So item 8.1 is moved by Councillor Marula, seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor, electronic vote. Thank you. On to item nine, staff presentations. We have the annual presentation of the Hamilton Cycling Committee. I'd like to call upon Chris Ritzma and Kate Berry of the Hamilton Cycling Committee to present their annual update. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for welcoming us this afternoon to provide this update on the activities of the Hamilton Cycling Committee and the continuing growth of cycling in the city. And Councillor Whitehead, we look forward to welcoming you to join Councillor Pauls and the committee. My name is Kate Berry. Um, I live in Ward 2 in the North End with my five-year-old daughter. My name is uh, Chris Risma. I live in Ward 2 also in Beasley. Uh, we're both uh, very passionate about cycling and uh, we're proud to work on the committee, uh, or on the work that the committee has achieved and the energy and th enthusiasm for cycling in Hamilton. The cycling committee has 14 members who represent neighbors, neighborhoods from across the city. All of us bring to our table not only um, our experience as citizens and cyclists, uh, but we also bring many and varied professional experience and perspectives. Chris is a civil servant. I'm a civil engineer. We also have members with experience in urban planning, policing, uh, cycling equipment and sales, finance, government, travel, and tourism. You can see here the six-piece mandate of the Hamilton Cycling Committee. Chris and I will be talking through um, what was, has been achieved by the committee in each of these areas over the past year. Uh, cycling is a key component of a healthy multimodal uh, city transportation system that integrates walking, cycling, and transit in balance with private and commercial vehicles. 
As part of our mandate, we, incur we work to encourage uh, cycling as an alternative to driving. This is important because each trip that shifts from a car to a bicycle helps to reduce traffic congestion, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce air pollution, and reduce road wear and tear. Increasing cycling will support the key strategic goals for our city, including the Climate Emergency Declaration, the Vision Zero Action Plan, and creating a great place to raise a child and age successfully. Trips of five kilometers or less are a key opportunity for cycling rather than driving, and most citizens regularly make trips within that distance range. For example, Ottawa Street to our east and McMaster University to our west are both around five kilometers from where we currently stand. Different people have different comfort levels with cycling. Some cycle only for recreation and some commute by bike. Some do both, some do neither. Understanding what people are comfortable with is front of mind for our committee members when we're providing feedback on cycling infrastructure projects and when we are educating citizens where they can find trails, cycle tracks, bike lanes, and streets that they feel comfortable to use. Research shows that there is a high quality, if there's a high quality cycling infrastructure in place, two thirds of the population are interested and willing to choose cycling for transportation. So building a high quality network of bike lanes, bike tracks and multi-use trails across Hamilton is vital for us to shift more journeys from cars to bicycles. The cycling committee works collaboratively with community groups to encourage more citizens to cycle. We're really lucky to have so many passionate, interested, engaged organizations here in Hamilton. Uh, that includes New Hope Community Bikes, Hamilton Cycling Club, Share the Road Cycling Coalition, Cycle Hamilton, Dundas Rides, Hamilton Bike Share, and the Everyone Rides Initiative. Collectively, these organizations represent hundreds and hundreds of cyclists across the city. A committee participates also in academic research, such as the Minimum Grid Cycling Network, by City Lab Hamilton. And we are also a member of the Hamilton Strategic Road Safety Committee. And we ensure that we keep informed of road safety um, and cycling matters by participating in professional um, transportation conferences, such as the Ontario Bike Summit. For the past couple of years, uh, the Cycling Committee has hosted a cycle-themed film screening. It's a free of charge community event. In 2019, we screened Afghan Cycles. It was an inspiring documentary film, and that was followed by a discussion panel to explore the unique challenges that women experience when cycling. We already have um, a great film lined up for our 2020 screening, and that's scheduled for June as part of the Hamilton Bike Month celebrations. Uh, as the committee supported the Hamilton Bike Buddies program. Uh, the Hamilton Bike Buddies program is a partnership of Everyone Rides Initiative, Cycle Hamilton, and the City of Hamilton. It involves setting up a mentor, someone comfortable with cycling, and someone less comfortable. They're meant to learn together and cycle together. It's a program that's being tested in Hamilton and other communities. <clears throat> I am a, a, a bike buddy myself uh, as a mentor, and I feel it's a great opportunity to be involved in mentorship of all, for all kinds of cyclists. It's been a great opportunity to recognize that people of all ages and backgrounds have different comfort levels on a bicycle. It's been great to help someone feel more comfortable on a bicycle and on the infrastructure that currently does exist. We're currently trying to meet once a month and also meet up for any cycling related events. It's been a great way for my bike buddy to connect with the existing cycling community made up of volunteers and people cycling for various reasons. One of our other initiatives to encourage citizens to cycle was the Trail of Two Cities a community bike ride in May. Uh, which uh, is coll a collaboration between the Hamilton Cycling Committee and the Burlington Cycling Committee. The 40-kilometer ride around the bay included a visit to So Hungry Food Festival on Ottawa Street. It was a bit rainy and cool this past year, but there was a good turnout, and we plan to host this event again in 2020. The Cycling Committee continued its yearly bike light handout that coincides with the time change in November. Uh, we want to ensure that the community stays safe while cycling at night, so we set up in strategic locations around the city to offer lights to cyclists that did not have any. Uh, citizens from the city came together. They come together each June to celebrate Bike Month. It features a whole smorgasbord of events and activities to engage cyclists of all ages and ability. Our committee members are heavily involved in supporting Bike Month events throughout the city. We saw a huge turnout of several hundred cyclists at City Hall on Bike Day um, on the 27th of May, so that was the main kickoff event for Bike Month. 
students from Benetto Elementary School and St. Lawrence Catholic Elementary School in the Ward 2 came together for a group ride from the North End through downtown to City Hall as part of the day. And I participated with my daughter. Um, it was wonderful. The children were so excited to be part of those festivities. And that, that ride you can see in the photograph on, on the right-hand side there. Um, that ride was made possible thanks to New Hope Community Bikes as the organizer, but also thanks to the Bay Street bike lanes, um, which are you know, separated, protected uh, cycle lanes. Um, so having good quality cycling infrastructure, like the Bay Street lanes, is vital to making civic spaces accessible to people of all ages and abilities by bicycle. Um, another fantastic community event during Bike Month was the Hamilton Bike Fair uh, that was held in Carter Park in Ward 2. There were lots of families turned out for this event, uh, which seeks to promote and advocate for more inclusive, safe and interconnected, cycle-friendly Hamilton. Uh, the fair features interest groups and educational information and included a Ride Smart Bike Rodeo for children that was put on by New Hope Community Bikes. So as part of our mandate, the cycling committee comments on proposed cycle infrastructure and provides advice and recommendations to staff. This is something we really enjoy and we feel is uh, very valuable. So we are keen to participate in the planning of infrastructure going forwards and we welcome the opportunity to discuss cycling matters with, with you, with ward councillors and, and with citizens. We provide feedback on various infrastructure projects across the city uh, in 2019, including uh, York Boulevard and the Herkimer McQueen intersection in Wards 1 and 2, uh, Governor's Road in Ward 13, and Lime Ridge Road West in Wards 8 and 14. Our committee also has a mandate to monitor the implementation of the cycling master plan, and this is something that we've been working on with staff recently in order to track the progress more closely from month to month. Hamilton Cycling Network, as shown here, uh, compromises a mixture of bike lanes, multi-use trails, and shared streets. The network continues to grow and become more connected each year. Planned projects are shown in red on this map. Successful installations during 2019 included Governor's Road in Ward 13, Lock Street in Ward 1, and Parkside Drive in Ward 15. Uh, there were also several projects that experienced delays and have therefore been carried over for installation in 2020. Hence, in 2020, there is lots of cycling infrastructure installation to do this year, and we're looking forward to supporting that work. This is the City of Hamilton's planned 2020 network with the proposed installations shown in red. These include several major projects, the Hunter Street bike lanes in Ward 2, the Claremont Access Trail in Wards 2, 3, 7, and 8, Melvin Avenue and Barton Street bike lanes in Ward 5, Lime Ridge Road West in Ward 8 and 14, Stonehenge Drive and Kitty Murray Lane in Ward 12. It's important that we make 2020 an ambitious and successful year of installations in order to deliver on the continued development of our cycling network, which is one of the priority actions identified in the City of Hamilton's Vision Zero Action Plan for 2019 to 2025. Cycling is growing in Hamilton. Uh, one key indicator of growth is the Transportation Tomorrow Survey. Uh, that collects data every five years, most recently in 2016. Uh, this chart you may have seen before, it shows cycling mode share percentage for each ward based on 2016 boundaries, so keep that in mind. Uh, so this shows you the proportion of all journeys that are made by bicycle for each ward. And you can see the trend in the data for each ward over the 15 years from 2001 to 2016. Cycling has increased in the majority of wards, and in some wards it's more than doubled since 2011. We expect this upward trend to continue as cycling infrastructure becomes more extensive and more connected. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to see uh, the next data set, so that'll be due for collection in 2021. Last our final slide. So to summarize on our last slide, um, there will be lots of cycling initiatives 
events and infrastructure happening in 2020. Um, and as a committee, we're really excited to support that work. We're currently helping staff to update cycling information boards beside trails and parks around the city. And we're investigating ways that we can help to reduce bicycle theft in Hamilton through the Project 529 initiative that has been adopted in Ottawa, uh, Vancouver, and other cities across North America. We'll be hosting and supporting cycling events in 2020, and we encourage and welcome all councillors to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. have a number of questions for you. Councillor Farr. Thank you both. Um, appreciated seeing the improved stats in Ward 2, and I'll bet given it's a two-year delay, we'll have even better stats given the infrastructure. And um, also appreciated your comments up top, welcoming your new council member. Enjoy that conversation. And uh, on Wednesday nights, is it through you, Chair, you meet? That's up to the committee to change. Yeah, it's currently, currently the first Wednesday of the month. First Wednesday of the month. Sounds like he's already bringing a motion forward. I'll let you deal with it at the appropriate forum. Through you, Chair. Um, Chris, you sent an email uh, a couple recently. Well, it was a tweet on the property that's uh, expired on in your neighborhood, and that's yes. another issue altogether that I'm waiting on a response still from Lisa in building department. Just checked in, maybe before you leave, we'll catch up on that. Secondly, you sent a motion uh, from your committee. Uh, I'm curious, uh, was that a unanimous motion um, that we didn't talk about here today, but one I look forward to meeting with you in the near future on through you, Chair? So through the chair, uh, that's something that the committee's been working on. Um, right. There's been uh, work being done by various members to kind of add certain things. Uh, it's not something that we've actually put forward yet. Okay, so, uh, so it's, it's in its draft. Exactly. It was something that we wanted to discuss, and that was one of the things that moving forward we'd like to do is before we try and like put things on you to discuss, we want to try and make sure we have a conversation ahead of time to make sure that it's something okay. that's, that's you know we can work on together. Smart as our advisory committee on cycling, I think that's good. And therefore, as well, with that answer, I won't get into the depths of your draft and just look forward to having that discussion. Um, and probably uh, we can appreciate your reaching out not only to the Ward 2 Councillor, but all Council to go over this draft. True? Yes, so di different committee members, hopefully, that are, are in the, the relevant wards have reached out to their various Great. members, and anybody who doesn't have representation so far is going to try and reach out to people who, who they can to. Well, I'm glad you sent it. it uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's an admirable initiative with all the, the whereases and the therefores, be it uh, resolved. And being the conduit uh, um, uh, organization that works with all those other cycling organizations that you referenced in your presentation, among other good points that are relevant to this draft, um, I think we're in good hands. It's, a, it's a, my early uh, look at it is, uh, you know, anything's possible and it's shoot, shooting for big things and it can't come from a better source, so I appreciate that. And, and always the presentations and your volunteer involvement, quite obviously. So if I can get the answer on the building thing, I'll let you know before you leave it either way. Perfect. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, and uh, if, uh, and I would think you would, uh, want uh, uh, Council truly engaged in the great work you do, you wouldn't set it on Council night, you wouldn't send it on GIC night, I don't know how Wednesday became the, the date, but hopefully we can have a good conversation at the committee about making a, appropriate time and date so that we can have full participation in the, in the conversation. Um, one of the things I've been uh, talking about a long time, and, and you're going off with of the master plan, but you're going off with of the master plan with no guidelines. Uh, Calgary, Edmonton, many cities have developed these guidelines. I'm still waiting for the city to do theirs. Uh, understanding the function of our roads, uh, economically, bus, uh, function is important when you inter interlace uh, uh, cycling uh, lanes. And I think Edmonton did a very good job with it, quite frankly. I think Calgary didn't do too bad either. We don't have one. So Herkimer would have never happened if we had those guidelines in place. Uh, because there are metrics that you have to meet uh, to justify uh, uh, going to different degrees in regards to uh, uh, isolated bike lanes versus painted lines versus so forth, because you have guidelines. So even the community will understand ahead of time what the limitations are based on those agreed upon guidelines once they're approved and in place. So I guess right now, uh, we're running, one hand is running off in a direction and labeling and naming streets off without understanding the functionality of many of these streets in these locations. At the same time, we're, we're still working on those guidelines uh, uh, with the city through our master transportation plan. I hope that comes together because I think that would be 
in the end, something that's predictable, uh, something that's comprehensive, uh, and something that is easy, understandable by people on both sides of the debate. Because uh, I, I support cycle lanes so only where, where it means the north, south, east, west direction, and it doesn't need to be on every road. It needs to be on roads that make sense. And I've always had that position. So I think we need to expand the network, I'm with you. Uh, but let's just do it in a tactical, strategic manner. Which brings me to the, uh, the question of, because right now I've been working on, I think Councillor Merlin might be working on it as well, um, but we're t looking at the hydro corridors, and I have a lot of them, you know, through 14 and 8, and converting those, uh, I'm talking to hydro, and they, they love the idea to put uh, 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 mountain bike li uh, uh, lanes through there, so it wouldn't be asphalt, it would be graveled, uh, and we, you could drive all the way to Caledonia. I mean, and, and through the city, uh, through these corridors, right down to Dundas and then on the Ferguson Station. So there's just so many neat little connections you can make. And I've talked to many people in my ward. In fact, I, they prefer to be taking those kinds of bicycle recreational trips than being on the road at all. Ro road isn't a necessity to them in the context of getting to work. They're looking for a relief and, and a good, uh, uh, healthy life living, uh, uh, and cycling is part of that. If they can do it off-road uh, that's convenient to them, they prefer that. I mean, they made that loud and clear. In fact, we're working on uh, William McConnell Park. I think we've had a lot of requests on creating a, a track up there as well for cyclists. So you can see that there's a lot of recreational cyclists that don't really care about the road network. They'd rather see this trail network uh, expanded and, and prioritized. So that's the, the give and take on the, on the cycling piece. So I just want to know what you feel the impact of that would be on uh, cycling on the streets when we start developing our trails better, like London, Ontario did. Through the chair, I, I think it, I guess it depends how good the trails are. Um, really, for a fully accessible cycle network, it needs to be you know smooth, paved, hard surface that can be maintained and can be cleared of snow. And so that's obviously difficult to do if it's still dirt tracks. You know, we want the cycling infrastructure to be um, access, accessible for all ages and abilities. So whether you're using you know like a, a kids on small bikes or people yeah. using a cargo bike and or bikes with a trailer, and so that you're, it's uh, usable for everyone. So do we, do we have any idea how many children are cycling in the wintertime? Through the chair, I don't, we don't have any statistics on that. Pretty low number, I would, I would, I would guess. Would that be fair? I, th I think um, the numbers could be low for summertime too. I mean, the, the current infrastructure in our city does not fair support um, all ages and all abilities. Fair enough. Uh, the other question I, I was going to ask is, um, because we're using, what, 20% 20, 20 of our roadway now in some cases uh, with these de de designated uh, uh, dual lanes. Um, and I'm looking at, uh, at the actual numbers of people versus cars, versus ca or carpools, versus buses. How many, uh, in, in regards to people per laneway, uh, what advantage are we getting on the cycling uh, versus uh, those laneway counts? Of, of moving people east, west, north, south? So through the chair, I, I would just say, you know, I think that in general, I think, you know, if you have bicycle lanes being used to their full capacity, they move more people than, than cars would in a car lane. Obviously, they might not be utilized to, the, to that degree. However, I would say that, you know, similar to like a sidewalk on a side street that's not being utilized, you know, just counting the number of people doesn't necessarily explain uh, a good reason for putting in a bike lane. Sometimes a bike lane on a quiet street makes sense because otherwise they would have to make a huge detour, which on a bike can be excessive, right? So Cannon Street, where we ha have, or Bay Street, where they pretty well jammed every intersection uh, at peak hour, peak mornings in regard to vehicle traffic. When there's virtually no uh, bicycle traffic, I see it every morning. And so again, I'm looking at cost benefit analysis and uh, what the, the negative side is versus the positive side. And right now I'm seeing a huge negative side at peak hours versus uh, the, the traffic loads on, on the side streets. So I'm trying to understand better um, so that we optimize the use for both, all mobility. And pedestrians is the other one where we had the debate, I don't know if it was your organization or another organization that went after the issue that it was okay to block off drop offs for people with disabilities at the GO station. I thought that was remarkable that cyclists would think that they have a priority over pedestrians that are getting dropped off at the bus station to get to school in, 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 uh, in Mississauga. Didn't make sense to me. So I, I want to make sure that we understand the hierarchy as pedestrians and, and certainly people with disabilities. 
uh, then cyclists, then cars. So I understand the hierarchy, but somehow the cyclists are forgetting about the pedestrians on that one. Because when I saw that motion come out and send out to the cyclists and tell them to call uh, counselors, I actually saw the resolution. They, they, they were framing it in such that we're, we were favoring cars versus really what we're favoring were people getting dropped off at a, a safe spot. So help me understand how we can be speaking the same language without talking over each other. Yeah, uh, through the chair, I think that, um, you know, we, we talked in our slides about multimodal transport network. We, we absolutely embrace the need for balance between the different needs and modes. Um, and we want a, a transportation system that works for everybody. Um, and that's so it's important to have debate, to have input on designs at an early stage um, so that we don't get into situations where we're still figuring out those details at such a sure. late a late time so um, you know as a committee we, we all have we all have our different experiences and we we're ready and willing to discuss those I think in terms of you know data and statistics of looking at the um, efficiency or efficacy of pieces of infrastructure, we don't have access to that information and, and that would be interesting, sure, to see. Yeah, I just wanted to see the experience. I, I was very in favor of having that east-west connectivity on the, um, on the, on the Hunter's uh, Lane. My problem was uh, that we shouldn't be uh, prioritizing that over uh, darts and over uh, mothers dropping off their uh, their sons with broken legs uh, at the bus station and, and forced them now to have to walk across the street versus uh, a walk right into the in the station. It didn't make sense to me that cycling would take a priority over that. And that was really strange in how that um, rally went, how they framed it when they weren't framing it properly. This wasn't about cars. This is about people who had the inability to walk great distances to get to their, their bus stop. So I wanted to highlight that because I think that was misunderstood. Uh, unfairly, and that's why I'm taking a keen interest now in getting directly involved with the cycling because I want to make sure that we're not talking over each other, we're talking and, and advancing the ultimate goal is creating greater networks of transportation, predictable transportation across the city, which we should be doing. Um, but back to uh, uh, the laneways on Cannon Street. So Cannon Street has well been established, uh, it's in place. Um, cycling has changed uh, because the observation on that is there's more people using. Um, uh, electric devices along that laneway than their actual cyclist. Is that your, your observation as well? Through the chair, no, I've not seen many electric devices on Cannon. In my own, I, I work next to Cannon Street Lane. Um, I don't have any statistics. So we're talking about assisted devices, so we're talking about uh, uh, mopeds, we're talking uh, those kinds of uh, vehicles uh, have, starting to have you use the Cannon uh, Street stretch. Uh, scooters, you haven't observed that? Uh, through the chair, I've observed far more bicycles than uh, Okay, fair enough. Um, back to the uh, original question then. Here's an established lane. Uh, how many people uh, 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 per day are, are traveling on, on that mode of transportation versus the other lanes on that same street? Through the chair, we don't have that data. We'd refer to staff. I'd be interested in seeing that data as well because we're talking about if we build it, they will come and that the numbers will be greater. So I think I heard uh, the one speaker, so here's an example. Let's measure it and we can measure it and determine if that is in fact the case. Thank you. And through the chair, I, I would just like to clarify mm -hmm. that's potential uh, travel throughput, not, not like the current, obviously, because we don't have the exact numbers right now. So, Councillor Pauls. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm glad cycling is growing, but I'm just wondering, it says Ward 1, 2, 3, and maybe 4, and uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, it's not really growing. Why, why is that reason? Where the mountain, we have 259,000 people living there, and downtown, uh, that, uh, roughly about 100. So why is it growing? Um, where there's more traffic, it seems, and not where there's more space up on the mountain. Just wondering if you know the reason. So we, through the chair, we just wanted to bring up our, one of our first slides there. Mm -hmm. The one, you know, the one before. Um, I don't live on the mountain. I don't live on the mountain, but um, I'm interested in your perspectives, Councilor Paul, mm -hmm. but one of the things here we wanted to highlight is uh, some of the key factors associated with higher rates of cycling, and so if you think about the mountain, 
Um, and perhaps the distribution of destinations is bigger distances on the mountain that mm. maybe um, you see higher cycling potential where there are destinations closer together that trips are less than five kilometers and the population density can be a big factor in that too. Um, so that's only my own speculation, but I think that would be a contributing factor. It's, it's very interesting. The people that are um, most in the committee are people from Ward 1, <coughs> 2, 3, like, uh, and, and I love cycling, and I know on Stone Church, there's from the east right to Ancaster, and I bike it all the time, and there's so much space there. So I'm just, if we're really interested, we really have to engage uh, people in cycling, not just to, just down the mountain, but all over, if that's what we want to do. And that's what I'm concerned. It seems like uh, it's a different city up there, you know, and we have the beautiful spots. And, and um, so I'd be interested to know why, uh, where there's more space, you know, to, and to bike longer, even to go to work or whatever, just a little bit more, you know, there isn't uh, enthusiasm of people wanting to bike. So through the chair, I would just also, you know, bring up the fact, like, like Councillor Whitehead said too, you know, some of it's comfort too. Some of the bike lanes on, on the mountain are, are the paint, like we have like on, uh, on Sterling or on Delaware in the lower city, where they're a little bit slower and there's less traffic. But then there's certain areas, uh, like I think Mohawk Road or some areas on the mountain that have painted bike lanes that are a little bit faster. So I think that adds to a kind of a discomfort and we need to kind of work to make more comfortable pathways, which could be... Uh, you know, hydro corridors and things like that, or it could be, you know, off-road cycle tracks. Uh, but also I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, land use planning and things like that, it kind of comes back to that high density of, of locations and things like that. I, I, you know, I do live in Ward 2, and, and as you say, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of us from Ward 2 in, in the lower city, uh, but I also did grow up in Burlington, I, so I know all about the style of living that comes with uh, with, with living in a, a mountain-esque kind of area. And, you know, I'll say from my experience in Burlington, you know, a lot of stuff was within walking distance too. And without proper cycling infrastructure or anything like that, I ended up bicycling on the sidewalk, which in Burlington is legal. Here mm -hmm. it's, it's not so much. And there's a lot of areas where you, you, you know, you end up seeing a lot of cyclists on the sidewalk because they don't feel comfortable on the road, even for just short rides. You know, people like me who are comfortable on a, on a bike, I wouldn't bicycle on the mountain to go to a variety store or to the pharmacy or something like that. And I just want to say, the last time I spoke, uh, I was asking about how many trips is, uh, you know, um, 50. We, and I said something like, let's say there's 100. And I really felt like people misunderstood me. I don't ever say there's 100 people that bike in the city of Hamilton because I bike all the time and we bike up in the country and there's a whole group, like even the Dundas group, I bike with them as well. So I want to be clear that I never said there's 100 people the bike in Hamilton. There's a lot more. And uh, I want to be clear that the public knows and the, you know, uh, even the papers when they write things, you have to be careful because I did get criticized. And I want to make it clear, I love biking. I think it's needed. It's a wonderful thing for our health, for everything. So I just want that to be clear. And I'm looking forward for my fellow Councillor Whitehead joining us on the committee because we, we really need two people just in case one of us can't make it or we have other commitments. So thank you. And through the chair, uh, Council Pauls, I think we'd really like to work with you on that issue of how do we uh, increase those numbers on the mountain wards. Councillor Nan. Thank you, through the chair, thank you both for your presentation and for your service on the advisory committee. Um, I had a quick question only because I didn't see it in the slides, um, and that was whether or not the committee is affiliated to the Wear Yellow Day or if there's any work that the cycling advisory committee is doing around uh, the work that other parts of the city are doing along with public health and the school board <laughs> of um, supporting children, young people, walking, cycling, wheeling to school and promoting active transportation in that way. Certainly, through, through the, the chair. chair. Thank um, you. Thanks, Councillor Nan. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have several committee members who are specifically interested in child mobility and walking and cycling for school journeys, and I'm, I'm one of them. I, I work for an organisation that focuses specifically on that. Um, so I'm very familiar with, with that work, and we have Roman and some others who 
a real passion. We haven't done anything specifically as a committee, but we're interested. And uh, one of the initiatives we're interested in in the year ahead is called School Streets, and that's a concept where you um, create a car-free zone in front of a school um, at pick-up and drop-off time. So you're kind of creating a car-free buffer around a school, and that's you know in response to high levels of congestion and traffic safety concerns around schools with the high level of driving. Um, so that's something we're interested in pursuing in Hamilton. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, in Ward 3 through the chair, uh, the Cannon Street uh, bike lane is going to extend uh, where it currently drops off at Sherman mm -hmm. and then picks up a little later down on the east end over towards Ottawa. There's a gap right in the mm -hmm. stadium precinct. Uh, so we're looking forward to that gap being filled so that we have one interconnected line. Um, and what's really important about that lane is the fact that there's an elementary school there, there's a high school there, and there's a rec center there. So in terms of supporting our, our local families to be able to encourage themselves and their children to take the bike over to the rec center or over to school, uh, we're really looking forward to that piece being completed. So my question to you through the chair is, did the committee have a, uh, an opportunity to comment on the design for that completion? Was it brought up in the work that uh, you, you mentioned that you're uh, reviewing annually our bike infrastructure plans? Was that one of the items that was covered or addressed with the Through committee? the chair, it's not one that I personally recall uh, seeing. Chris? Uh, through the chair, I, I don't recall it being discussed. I don't know if it was, I, it seems like it's a more recent thing, so I don't know if it was discussed at a prior cycling committee, but I don't believe in detail it's been discussed. I know that we've talked about it as an extension, but, but the actual plan isn't something we've talked about or how it's going to actually be laid out. Okay, I'd be happy to follow up online, uh, offline, thank you. Councillor Marula. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wonderful work, folks. Uh, I'm just wondering now, um, it's, not a, it's not a surprise, I guess, or a shock to anyone that I'm gonna ask this question, but your activity on, on social media seems to be very critical of council, and you sit on an advisory committee, and I was just emailed, no shock to anybody. I have a group of, I have a team of lawyers that are monitoring every, every tweet with my name or city council for the last five years. And I'm just wondering how an active participation on an advisory committee um, and then being almost libelous on Twitter and then coming to us and asking us for a favor. I'm wondering, I don't know what world some people are living in, but. I'm very offended by the fact that there's a tendency in this city to publicly try to shame council, but then come here and ask for favors. And I'm just, through you, um, Mr. Chairman, I think it's important that we, we recognize a problem before we try to fix it, and I'm just recognizing that today. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. Do you want to address that? Uh, so through the chair, uh, I, I don't know exactly which tweets you're referring to exactly, but... Uh, 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 I, I don't need them here if, if, uh, if you don't mind. If you want to email me privately, though, I, I don't mind that. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think one of the things that we, I discussed this week was, you know, making sure that we're positive. And I think that we all very much appreciate the work that, that council has been doing. Um, and, you know, maybe on, on Twitter and other things, I think that I would agree that sometimes everyone's a little bit critical. But I think that, uh, you know, people, people are looking for, like, an outlet. Uh, you know, I, I've been looking for, like, a, as, I, as uh, Councillor Farr mentioned, I tweeted him, actually, about an issue on my street. I think that kind of comes back to something else, which is like a lack of 311 and, and other ways to communicate with the city. But yeah, so I, yeah. thank you. I'm going to put myself on the list. So, Councillor Marula, would you take the chair? Go ahead. Thank you. So, I have um, four questions for you related to your presentation. So, the first is the photo that you had of the the Sobe bike in the in the winter with the snow. So I'm going to assume that that was an intentional choice to include that photo specifically of a cyclist in the winter. Can you talk to me about the challenges of winter cycling and specifically to Hamilton in terms of rate of people cycling and, and what they face when they want to ride in the winter? Through the chair. Uh, so that's actually a picture that was sent to me or was posted, I believe, on social media by uh, a colleague and friend, uh, more of a friend, I guess, Cameron Croach, um, who I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, he's an avid cyclist in the winter too and someone who cares about that. And I cycle to work every day, even in the snow. Uh, I was there at bike day, which was uh, last Friday, which was one of the coldest days uh, of the winter. I think it was the coldest day of the winter so far this, this year. 
Uh, so I think, you know, when it comes to bicycling in Hamilton in regards to the winter, one big issue is, is obviously snow clearance. I will say that the city's done an excellent job this year of, of clearing Cannon and, and Bay, um, salting and making sure that it, it's not slippery. Uh, we've had still some issues of people putting their personal snow from their, from their lot onto the Cannon Street bike lane. Um, but, you know, overall it's been all right. Um, but as you go further east where the bicycle lanes are, are less used potentially or less people, it's le lower traffic, you know, in, in uh, Ward 3, there's been some areas by uh, Bernie Custis where the bike lanes kind of have become a, a snow storage, uh, which I totally understand, you know, a lot of areas need a boulevard, uh, usually half a meter minimum to put snow there for the winter. And I understand that there's a snow clearing issue, especially when you have sidewalks right against the road. But that's one issue is, you know, you end up among the cars, they're slush, and the cars aren't very happy that you're not using the bike lane as well. When there is one there, it's just kind of filled with snow. So I know the snow clearing, while it is pretty good, has you know, it's still a challenge in certain areas. And just anecdotally, a day like today, my kids are off because of the strike, and my son rode his bike to the park to go play hockey, which is uh, an interesting uh, juxtaposition, I guess. Um, on the, the fourth slide, you break down the four types of cyclists. So you have the strong and fearless, enthused, interested and concerned, and no way I'm never going to get on a bike. Can you talk to me about point three, the interested and concern that 60%. Who are those people? Well, it's the majority of us. Um, and so they're people who maybe don't have, don't have the equipment or um, don't see um, you know, themselves as cycling at present, but if they could see um, infrastructure that would be comfortable to use, to use bike lanes, to have uh, clear networks, uh, perhaps with wayfinding, or we've got good mapping, but having a full network, being able to understand how they could you know, easily get around on a bicycle, then they are willing to, willing to use a bike. And specifically, that infrastructure that would convince that m majority, the 60%, to consider cycling, what is it in terms of infrastructure are they looking for? Yeah, so really I suppose what, we're, what do we mean by high quality <coughs> infrastructure? Um, we're, we're talking about um, dedicated cycling facilities, like dedicated space for cycling that's sep separated from motor vehicle traffic. Um, that separation creates you know, real safety and perceived safety benefits. Um, and so that makes all the difference, particularly for, more, uh, you know, for younger riders, older riders, and those who are less confident. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, the conti continuity of the cycling network. So could you go to your slide for the 2020 um, mm -hmm. cycling infrastructure? <laughs> so I, I notice a pretty big um, improvement over 2019. And once all those projects in red are completed, I can see another really <coughs> big improvement there. But it's still pretty clear that the, the cycling network is pretty fragmented. Um, can you talk to me about how that impacts people choosing to cycle and what happens when our network is fragmented as it still is? Uh, so through the chair, I, I think that, you know, that 60% who's looking for good infrastructure is also the kind of people where if half a kilometer of their trip is all of a sudden among road, uh, users among trucks among cars uh, you know especially on high speed roads those are the kind of people that you know just will skip the trip altogether right so when it comes to a fragmented network it's really important to not have that because it's similar to having like a road that you know doesn't connect to anything right it's it's not it's not that you can just bicycle on the road it's that you know a lot of people can do that myself included but a lot of people can't and that's a huge portion of the population that just doesn't feel comfortable bicycling along cars along trucks especially and, uh, you know, that's something to keep in mind when connecting those, especially the small little spots that are just, you know, a couple hundred meters that just need to be fixed, like Hunter. So mainly that 60% of the people that are interested but need that, need that infrastructure to feel safe and uh, not be in, in traffic, even if it's for a small, small portion of their route. Yes. Um, final question is, uh, so on this map, you can see the Claremont access connection is a major connection between um, upper and lower, and also uh, the, the connection on Lyme Ridge, the major east-west connection. So 
I think those are two really um, positive connections that we're going to see in the next year um, that happen to particularly impact Ward 8. But if you go to your slide with the, the trends in each ward, so looking at that, the Ward 8 is one of the ones where the trend is actually decreasing. So I, I find that really interesting and I, I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention anyway as the Ward 8 counselor, knowing that we are bringing on some cycling infrastructure in the next year, but I think that um, that's a challenge that I'm going to take on personally. I know we have Mohawk College in Ward 8, which right now is not connected with any kind of cycling um, network and uh, some other um, improvements that can be made. So I'm, I'm really interested to working with you for recommendations of what we can do to, uh, to get Ward 8 to look more like Ward 1. So thank you for the presentation. With that, I'll take the chair back. We have a couple more uh, questions for a second time. Councillor Whitehead. Uh, actually, one interesting statistic is there's more kilometer cycling lanes in Ward 8 than there is in Ward 2. So be careful what you see there. Uh, West, for example, Gar Street is a cycling lane and has been painted. Uh, Rymel was done uh, last year. It was above grade uh, from Upper Paradise to Upper James. Um, so uh, Limeridge has been done. I got that on and I got the mountain uh, Claremont axis uh, on, on the map. So, in fact, when you take a look at how much is actually going on in Ward 8 and Stone Church as well, that's right, Stone Church as well. So when you take a look, it's not a decrease. In fact, it's a, there's an increase. But when you have 250 kilometres of a, a laneway versus 100 kilometres of, of a laneway, then when you're looking at percentage of laneway uh, taken up in, in, in a particular ward, it may show differently on the chart. But when you actually squeeze in how many actual kilometres of laneway, then that's what when you realise that there has been a big... Uh, uh, boost in, in Ward 8. So be careful what you, you read. There has been a lot more, and I made this argument last term at Council, we have more kilometer lanes of bicycle lanes than even Ward 2. So we are doing very well in Ward 8 and 14, you can see the big burp there is uh, uh, um, increase as well. The uh, one thing I, I've observed, and I, I thank Sam for his comment, because that was basically where I was coming from, that's why I went on the cycling committee, because I was getting hammered for taking care of people that have disabilities to get dropped of a bus station, and, I, and the cycling community went on this 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 attack that made me like the evil guy who was you know uh, anti-cyclist. When my issue wasn't being anti-cyclist, it was ensuring that we had drop-offs for people with disabilities. But that's how the cycling community framed me. And that's unfortunate. That's how, you don't make friends that way. So it's got to be characterized in the right way. If you're going to bang me up for. Uh, taking uh, a drop off for uh, uh, darts and people with disabilities at the train station, you want to attack me for that? Go ahead, I don't have a problem with that, but at least you're being fair. But when you characterize it in a different way, because you know you can't get away with uh, attacking me because I'm fighting for people with disabilities, uh, then, that, then that's being, I mean, that's changing the narrative and it's, and it's unfortunate and, and it's disingenuous. So I hope by getting on the committee, we can have better direct conversations uh, so that we don't uh, uh, get mixed up in these little games that get played. And the other thing is uh, on, on Rama Road, and I noticed this in Sudbury, and this is where I came from, is like a lot of their bicycling lanes aren't on the road. They're above grade. So on Rymo, uh, the community didn't want bicycle lanes. I want to make it clear, my community did not want bicycle lanes on Rymo Road. But I worked with Daryl at the time, and I said, could we look at the Sudbury solution to see how that works with our community? Went back, because it's such a busy road. We went back to the community. Uh, we tried the raised uh, uh, cycling lane at the, uh, at, at the um, sidewalk grade. The community overwhelmingly supported it. They wanted it off the road. They don't care about cycling lanes. They just don't want to have it conflicted with roadway. So I want to make it clear that on a go forward basis, where there's capacity, because downtown is limited, and I'd be the first one to agree, that you don't have the same level of capacity. But when you look at the mountain, when the opportunity prevails and you have the widths, Take advantage of it, because cyclists don't have a problem with it. Now they have no conflict on the roadway, and you don't have to create separate barriers. So you're doing it at a less uh, expensive cost. So I hope that's the direction we go. I hope we work constructively, and I hope that the cycling community, at least some, instead of taking radical uh, approaches, understand we all want the same thing. We want a, a very comprehensive, broad scope cycling network within our city. But let's do it right the first time. Thank you. Councillor Farr. Yeah. There's a spike in uh, Ritzman95 on Twitter today, and maybe even Sam Arula underscores, what is that one? 
You've got a few. Oh, you've got a <coughs> fake account then. Marula, <laughs> Marula underscore rules. No, you don't have the floor. He, for clarity, I've named him. No. It's not a point of order. I just named him. Just because you're. No, I'm not giving you the floor. Councillor Farr, you have the floor. I did name him. The point of order that you're named does not mean you automatically have. I am not giving you the floor, Councillor. So, so I have the floor, and I'm fine if he wants to respond. I did name him, and I shouldn't have. I'm sure the clerk will. If you'd like to challenge the chair, go ahead. Okay, chair has been challenged. Councillor Marula, go ahead. I call, I'm challenging the chair to be able to speak to this, so I'm moved by myself, second by Councillor Collins, and I'm allowed to speak. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Opposed? Okay, thank you. So, now that uh, that was defeated handily, as everything else they present, my God. So, that particular Twitter account is a fake account. Okay. Much you like most garbage on Twitter. <coughs> but I have no Twitter account. I voluntarily took my Twitter account down. And now, we're going through a reckoning phase. So I appreciate your time. Councillor Farr. Yeah, I'm going to get right at it instead of, uh, you know, uh, a, a light intro. So I, I get double complaints. I just from the answers that I've heard from car drivers, guys, uh, that bike lanes are cleared of snow before the car lanes are, then vice versa. Uh, complaints that car lanes are done before bike lanes from cyclists. That's kind of, I think, a good sign and something you should, because there's lots of, quite obviously, in Ward 2, uh, engagement going on from various uh, corners, including social media. Um, we had a public budget GIC with delegations all day, or all afternoon and into the night a week ago. One young lady uh, from the cycling community, really great advocate, and at the end of the, the, the five minute delegation, I had mentioned that in my 10 years, we've probably had 20 to 24 new kilometers of bike lanes in, in, in this ward. And we're lucky enough that much of it is, a lot of it is protected, but there's areas that we could protect with uh, 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 protective infrastructure further. And I asked for her to advise me on, on what painted lines she sees as a priority over other painted lines in Ward 2. As I've assembled a reserve of area rating funds to tackle just that, we have a, a plethora of lanes, some part of the, ma well, most part of the master plan, some not, but all successful as far as I'm concerned and as far as the statistics show. So I'm interested in finding areas where I can improve the infrastructure we have now. So I, I, I will just leave you with this, not really a question. I think we're probably ready to receive this at this point. I welcome you to do the same as the young advocate that came here last week. I, I'd, I'd like to know, I uh, honestly would like to know where are the best places to invest in even safer infrastructure in, in my ward. And I appreciate your time and uh, always an interesting uh, delegation annually. Thank you. No further speakers on 9.1. Moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Pauls to receive. All in favor? Carried. Carried. <laughs> Moving on to discussion items, 10.1 is withdrawn. Not sure. Yep. Can I understand uh, why it's been withdrawn again? Wasn't this withdrawn the last time, last public works meeting as well? And I haven't been, I haven't been here for three weeks, so now it's been withdrawn again? Through the chair, this is the first time it's been withdrawn. And in light of some of the questioning at AFNA, uh, we withdrew it just to bring back new information and okay. more more yeah. details for council's consideration. So there was one that was withdrawn in public works, which about three and a half weeks ago. Do you remember what it was? I thought it was along the same lines. Not sure. Through, through the chair, um, it wasn't from the fleet okay, energy fleet enough. facilities division. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Uh, Ten point two then which is the extension of the Senior Project Manager Master Plan. Any discussion? Not seeing any. Moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor, electronic vote.
Thank you. 10.3 MTO signal agreement. Is there any discussion on 10.3? Councillor Pearson. Just a question to staff, and I read the report, but um, it's only these specific locations that we're interested. We don't have, as I noticed further down on the page, Appendix A. Um, yeah, first page, Appendix A. We have a number of other locations, but we're not, we don't want to be involved in having those included in our coverage through you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Through the chair, no, it's just those four locations we're interested in. And that's because they're on our, sort of our corridor, is that the concern, the, the rationale that it's on our corridor as opposed to say Fruitland Road, which is a QEW? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Those are the ones that we have some interest in wanting to do the signal timing for those and the other ones gotcha. we don't have an interest in. Thank you for that. So we don't do the timing on the one at the Fruitland Road QEW off ramp. That's correct. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. So 10.3 is moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by anybody, Councillor Ferguson. All in favor? Thank you. 10.4, presto adoption, which was referred from Council. On 10.4, Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, as you said, Mr. Chairman, this was referred back to committee from Council because there was a lot of concern over the uh, $6 that would be charged to seniors over 80 for using the bus fare. So I just want to confirm with staff, and uh, I, I suspect, I see Nancy Purser is here, and I think Debbie's here too. And um, I want to confirm that you're really number, number A is really what you proposed before that went to council of how to transition off the paper tickets. But you've added an item B that uh, the city cover the cost for the Presto card, the one-time charge for seniors. And then item C, uh, just be removed the outstanding business list. Have I this was the walk-on report, so I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but is that the essence of what you're trying to do? Uh, th through the chair, the... Um the recommendation added is for Golden Age to include the $6 charge. The okay. other two are exactly as presented um, previously. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I'd be happy to move this. Sorry, I missed the end there. You're, do you have a motion to amend that, or is that no, that? No, I'd be happy to move the, staff, move the recommendation. staff recommendation. Okay, thank you. I'll come back to you for that. Councillor Jackson. Uh, th uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I, I very much appreciate that Council uh, referred this back. As you know, I had two main issues uh, that I voted against originally. The report, the Golden Age Pass, that I just felt, um, I just felt that it would have been a, somewhat of a betrayal to the seniors over the years. Uh, the wonderful policy we had here in Hamilton for 80 and older would uh, ride our system free all year. And secondly, the loss of the, um, of the tickets and the monthly pass, mostly the tickets for a variety of reasons, both for those that still like using the tickets, get access to the tickets, it's easier, and for the vendors who maybe get extra um, customers come in to their stores to buy the tickets. So I'd like to first of all thank the open-mindedness of Director Del Vidove and Manager Purser. I'm very pleased to see with the B part now of the uh, revised report that the Golden Age Policy Pass consists of a one-time Presto card, unlimited free transit, Hamilton residents 80 and older, that the cost of the card will be funded through current operating budget. Uh, very, very grateful for that. And secondly, um, to my other issue about losing the tickets uh, period, um, Mr. Chairman, through you to Director Del Vidover, Manager Purser, I, I need to read out an email. I promised I would read from the Hamilton Regional Indian Center that was sent to me by Dean Dux Tater, um, the language program executive. And he sent to me, Councillor Jackson, my name is Dean. I work for the Hamilton Regional Indian Center. where We're a community center that services many First Nations and non-natives in the community of Hamilton. My reason for contacting you is about the end of the HSR bus tickets. For us and this community centre puts us at a great concern for our clients and participants that we service. For many of us and our workers, it feels like this was a short notice and had we known about this sooner, we maybe would have sent a representative to Public Works. 
The clients we deal with, Mr. Chairman, are social assistance clients on ODSP. I contacted you because in the comments I read you were one who wasn't for the change of the tickets, losing them, and if there was any way of holding off on the change of ending the bus tickets entirely, please contact me below as my contact. Thank you. So I just, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to read that. I had assured the um, Mr. Dox Tater from the Regional Indian Centre I would um, both uh, record and and uh, put on the record his, read out on the record his uh, email to me. So with all of that in hand, uh, through you to Director Del Vidov, um, uh, Debbie, can you please uh, provide whatever you can in terms of assurances? I'm sure this type of service client isn't the only one that may be in our community with concerns about losing uh, the paper tickets. Maybe you could provide assurances and or what you and your staff are doing still to reach out to them. Mr. Chairman, through you, please. Um, so through the chair to the councillor, um, currently uh, we support over 130 plus social agencies throughout the city of Hamilton wow. uh, by providing and uh, selling tickets to those uh, specific agencies. As part of the phase out of those tickets, um, as uh, detailed in the report, we are creating a special purpose ticket which will be available to those agencies and any others that come forward that um, require uh, participation in what we do to support those agencies throughout the, the city. And um, those tickets will be made available to those uh, um, groups, uh, continuing moving forward until such time as there is a solution with Presto that addresses and will deal with that need for those uh, tickets, those one-off tickets in, in those particular circumstances. Uh, Director, that really raises my comfort level. I'm very pleased to hear the, um, the assurances and commitments you and Manager Purser have made. 130 of these agencies, so the Hamilton Regional Indian Center was just one of 130, but glad they brought it to my attention. And again, the special purpose ticket. And I believe, Debbie, um, through the discussions you and I have had in the last 48 hours, I believe you'll already have made contact uh, with Dean uh, Docs Tater as well, through you, Mr. Chairman. So through the chair, I did reach out. I've left a message uh, so Thank that you. I could uh, walk him through exactly what the plan is and reassure him uh, respecting the, you know, the concerns that he raised uh, to you through the email. I also would like to add that we uh, have also uh, uh, completed a robust um, uh, communications campaign. Uh, so once uh, this is approved, that uh, we will be reaching out uh, specifically to each one of those 130 um, uh, social agencies with uh, some information, contact number uh, in the event they have any questions and to keep those uh, lines of communication open as we transition um, away um, from the typical adult ticket to the special purpose ticket. Debbie, thank you. A closing comment, Mr. Chairman. Um, great thanks to Debbie and Nancy over the last couple of weeks for what they've done uh, to further um, alleviate any of the hardship that may be experienced. I still, in principle, am not a big fan at all of the um, extortion, basically, by the province, this, this uh, marriage that we en entered into, forced marriage, as I called it last time. However, in appreciation of staff at the HSR and with these two um, revisions on the Golden Age Pass and what they're still doing to accommodate 130 agencies in this community and making the landing as soft and as pleasant as possible in the eventual elimination of the bus tickets, I can support the revised report here today. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. That's good to hear. Thank you, Councillor. Um, welcome, Councillor Clark. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the, the committee's latitude to, to ask a few questions. So, to clarify, the $2.50 ticket would continue now as a special purpose ticket? So through the chair to those social agencies that we currently support, uh, that's correct. So it will be replaced by a special purpose ticket uh, uh, for that specific reason. And what about individuals who don't have any association with those agencies? What about the people who are truly poor and paying $3.25 is going to be onerous rather than two fifty? So through the chair, um, um, currently right now with the Presto equipment, there is not that ability to just pay that $2.50. So we came up with a special purpose ticket uh, to support those agencies. 
Um, with the Presto card, I, I know it's a $6 charge for the card, but there are benefits uh, to using that Presto card. Um, one specifically, if you buy a ticket or a pass and you lose that ticket or that pass, you no longer have that fare and you ha now have to repurchase that, that particular item. Whereas with Presto, uh, once your card is registered, you have that ability for those funds to be available to you when you replace that card so you're not losing that opportunity. Um, uh, currently, that's uh, something more than what you get with a ticket or with a fare. Um, and further to Councillor Jackson, uh, we do have the operating agreement that we were uh, um, uh, signed into with, with Metrolinx that did require us to reach an 80% adoption rate a year uh, subsequent to the device refresh, which we are currently on track to do this year. Um, so we are paying for that service for Presto, regardless if we get to the 80% or not. So that would be an additional cost to the city should we not achieve that 80%. Um, so um, we have to continue on. Every other transit agency within the GTHA has retired their fair media and their uh, passes. So we have naturally got up to a 55% adoption rate just through limited marketing. Um, and now with the uh, new equipment on board, uh, uh, the only way next to transition to get to that 80% is to start to withdraw the passes and the, and the paper tickets. And I guess here's my challenge. I don't really care what ha is happening in Burlington, Halton, or other communities that don't have the poverty levels that we have here in Hamilton. We have severe poverty in our community, and we have a lot of people who are not getting the tickets through those agencies. They're paying the, the, the price because that's all the money they have. And while we may have big fancy houses and we have two cars and we can, we can handle all these things and we can handle a $6 cost out of a Presto card, there are people in our community that cannot afford it. And we're making them go from $2.50 to $3.25 to satisfy Presto. That's what we're doing. And I, can't, I, I don't understand that. If we can create a special ticket for agencies, then surely to God we can create a special ticket for the poor in the community so that they can get to the doctors once a month, because that's all they need. They don't need to pay $6, they need to get to their doctors once a month, and they can buy a ticket for $250. And we're taking that away from them. I have real concerns, councillors, about this. We're missing, we're missing that. We have a responsibility to rule for everybody, including a minority. And where some people can't afford to do this, and I, I agree, saving 300000 or $400,000 is really important to our budget. But we're missing a component of it, and we haven't even been able to assess the number of them. So I have real problems. My preference would be, yeah, do the special ticket, but make it also available to the people who, who, who can't afford the $6. Who only need one bus ticket a month to get to the doctor's office, or two bus tickets a month, one to get to the grocery store, or whatever the case is. There would be a huge outcry if we were in increasing fares from $2.50 to $3.25 across the board. They would be protesting in front of City Hall but we're willing to do it on the poorest people in the community. And I have a problem with that. So I really hope we can find a solution to this because what's being proposed here is not solving the problem. We're ignoring the problem in order to satisfy Presto, in order to satisfy the Ministry of Transportation. I'd rather have the Ministry of Transportation take Presto or take Metrolinx back under, under their, their, their control and have them make these decisions because then it's going to be made decisions understanding the politics of what we need to do for poor people in our community, not just business. So I, I've said my piece. I can't support it when it comes to council. I really think we need to rethink it. Yes, we've come a great way. We're halfway there. But there's still a small minority in our community that do not have the means, do not have the money. They rely on that $2.50 ticket, and we're taking it away from them. 
and telling them to pay 325. It somehow just doesn't seem fair to me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Councilor Clark. Director Delvado, is there anything that you'd like to address? Is there any way that we could come up with a compassionate grant, anything like that for those, the card cost? So through the chair currently, we don't have a mechanism to have a compassionate grant. Um, certainly, you know, uh, you know I, I can't speak on what services all the social agencies have out there for individuals in the community that, you know, uh, do require support and, and need that one bus ticket or two bus tickets a month to get to, to where they're going. Um, so, uh, and then there's the other issue around managing all those tickets in the system that we currently have for our adult tickets. Um, is eight years past its shelf life that uh, in order to continue to manage that stock, we would need to you know, invest the additional capital to replace that system and then to continue with the tickets. And, uh, you know, it is a change, and once the tickets become available, then people may or may not necessarily move over to Presto, whereas where we need to get them in order to meet our, our requirements under the operating agreement of what we will be paying for. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Uh, well, for uh, gravity and, 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 and expediency, uh, I want to just say ditto in the context of Councillor Clark's comments. Thank you. Okay, no further speakers on 10.4. So this was moved by Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, I'd like to move it if I can get a seconder. And then I just have one more question for the director. If I can. Go ahead. Do I go with the question now? Yeah, you can okay. ask the question. Debbie, just so I understand this, the, uh, our current bus fare is $2.40 with a paper ticket, correct? So through the chair, it's two dollars. If you buy a ticket, it's two dollars and fifty cents. A cash fare is three dollars and twenty-five cents. Right, and someone pays six dollars once in a lifetime, it stays at two dollars and forty cents or two dollars and fifty cents, does it not? So, so through the chair, that's correct. The the purchase of the Presto card is six dollars, and it's a one-time purchase. Um, and then and, they're back to the traditional rate per trip. And then whatever whatever fares we are charging, so whatever our, our ticket fare is, our cash fare, mm -hmm. or how those fare increases in, uh, proceed through the years, that's what would be charged against that Presto card. Okay. And I think we, you know, it, all of us resist change, but it's, it's probably the right thing to do to have one pass that gets you anywhere in, in the GTHA. Yeah, which this card will do. And I realize it's the one, once in a lifetime $6 charge. And um, so I'm happy to move this, uh, this time of recommendation and thank them for what they did for the over 80s. I think that's really appropriate. And seconder for the, the staff recommendation. Oh, okay. Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you to um, Deb, I think. Um, just, just to carry on from the last questions, can you tell me what this means? Whatever the fare is that we are charging, they'll be charged. So with a Presto card, are you paying our equivalent cash fare now? Or are you paying our equivalent ticket fare? The equivalent of what we're charging now. Director? So through the chair, you would be paying the equivalent of what we are charging now. For a ticket or cash? For cash and for a ticket. I'm having trouble with that. A ticket is 250 it's, and oh, cash is 325 right. or something? Sorry. So you can't pay with cash on your Presto ticket, on your Presto card. So cash is cash. And then mm -hmm. when you use your Presto card to tap for a trip, you are charged the $2.50 for that trip. Okay, thank you. So, so now my next question is, how can we address the $6 charge for people who really can't afford it, but can afford $250 to, as Councillor Clark mentioned, go to the doctor or go to whatever they, use the bus for whatever they need to use it for when they need to use it, in spite, you know, knowing that they can't afford to be putting $25 and $30 on a Presto card at a time. So through the chair, um, 
I guess the question would be then how to make that determination as to who would qualify for that special purpose ticket and how we then determine that. Um, currently, uh, people who are on uh, ODSP and Ontario Works uh, are on Presto and they come with a uh, letter uh, that says they qualify for that discounted fare. So it's, it's managed and it's, and, it's, and it's going to the people who deserve that, that break in, in that regard. Uh, the struggle in those one-off situations with people who potentially maybe are not being addressed by a social agency and who have that circumstance that Councillor Clark is uh, indicating where they can't afford the $6 for the card but need to make that one or two trip a month. It would be, we would have to have a mechanism by how we would vet or say that, that you would be entitled to um, have that ticket as opposed to having to purchase a a Presto card like the, the you know, 55% currently of our ridership right now that, uh, that are using a Presto card. Thank you, and so could that determination be made at our, at our station? Like, like when my mother got her over 80 card, she had to go to Hunter Street. And so I guess I'm finding myself in a position where I really wanna say no to this staff recommendation for that reason. So therefore, if we say no, then, then we're in a quandary. So could we refer it back to you for you to, I know you, nobody wants to put it off and put it off, but we want to get it right. So could we refer it back to staff to come back and tell us how they could arrange an ability for an eligibility, which someone could come to the main office for, I don't, I don't like to say, to, to sort of, set people out there and make them feel like they're further victimized, but we do have to have a way around it. Could you come back with some suggestions about how that could be handled so that the people who truly need it, and there are many people who need it who are not on OW, and they're not on a medical o ODSP, who, who really struggle to meet their demands financially every month, if not every day. So, I am for referring it back, and I'm happy to put that motion forward to refer it back to staff to come back to the next meeting with something that will tell us how to handle this. I don't know whether I can get a seconder, and I don't know. Uh, we to put that on the floor now. So I'd like to put that motion on the floor okay. and seconded by Councillor Whitehead, okay. and we'll see whether or not there's support for that. Okay, so on the motion to refer refer back um, speakers on the motion. Councillor Nan. Thank you. Um, through the chair, so I'm um, just looking at the financial section on page three of the report. So the free Presto card for Golden Age Pass customers uh, at a total of $6,000 will be funded through the transit current operating budget. And then the item before that speaks to the reduction in budget reduction and the savings uh, that would be achieved through uh, removing the paper media from our system. Uh, and there's a savings of $113,000. And I know that we need to be careful about uh, our 2020 budget and therefore moving forward in terms of, you know, what service enhancements can we pay, uh, can we afford, and so on. That said, there may be an opportunity here for us to bridge a transition, um, which speaks to the points both Councillor Vanderbeek and Councillor Clark have raised in terms of uh, the $6 initial fee. And uh, I would support that motion being referred back and having staff come up with some sort of, whether it's a compassionate grant, whether it's a one-time uh, fee. The challenge with the one-time covering of a Presto card is even though it's been coined as a once-in-a-lifetime charge, uh, if you lose your Presto card, you have to replace it, and that's another $6. And, you know, I don't know about you all, but sometimes finding my own car keys, let alone my Presto card, becomes a bit of a challenge. Uh, things get misplaced, and each time that's another additional $6. Uh, I've heard accounts from residents in Ward 3 and other places as well in other parts of the GTA who have, uh, have already moved to the system where you misplace your card or you don't have your card on you that day, and how much the ticker goes up in terms of accessing transit. And in some cases, it can, it can be pretty profound. Uh, there was this one case on, um, on social media that the, the individual ended up paying $25 that day just to be able to take public transit. 
Um, so it is, it is an inconsistent system in that regard. I understand that we're bound by this agreement, um, that we do have to achieve the 80% target in order for this system to work. We're bound by it, but perhaps there is some creativity and innovation that we can find uh, to bridge the transition for our residents. Thank you. Councillor Wayhead. I, I certainly support the motion before us. In fact, I think the uh, the solution might be to a uh, lim very limited uh, aspect to, to to print off those 240 tickets uh, and uh, make them available. And, and what what the means and delivery of those tickets are, whether it's through our rec centers, whether it's through uh, uh, the councillors' offices, whether it's through some other means. Uh, and but we're talking about limited printing. So right now you're talking about 113,000, I think, in, in expenditures currently for printing. Is that right? So through the chair, that's what we currently are spending yeah. on, on printing for tickets and passes. So I'm, I'm suggesting that we, you know, that cost could be reduced significantly to, to, to maybe offset this, this differential. So we're not necessarily um, paying for the, the Presto card, but we're providing an opportunity for those that uh, uh, may not be able to afford the Presto card or doing one trip to ensure that uh, those tickets are still available for them. Anyway, it's, I'm going to ask you to work it out. I'm just throwing that out as a, a possible solution. And it's just a mechanism how, how you would get it out there. And the eligibility, I wouldn't focus too much on um, because I, I think that uh, I don't think it's going to be abused. And I think we need to pilot without the eligibility and see a measure whether, and then you could tell us on a quarterly ba uh, basis whether it is being abused. And we have to add eligibility to it. But, uh, but it would be for those unique circumstances, I think, is what we're, the real test is. So I, I look forward to that. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm all right then if the majority want to refer back. After all, I, I was a lone wolf a few, a few weeks ago. So, But I want to make sure on the referral, Mr. Chairman, that the advancements and the progress that Debbie and Nancy have brought today with the revised report on accommodating Golden Age and looking after the 130 agencies with a special purpose ticket will not be unwind or rewound just to somehow accommodate this further legitimate consideration. So through the chair, uh, uh, absolutely what we've proposed here today that uh, it, with the Golden Age Pass, um, we would still, that's still our recommendation. And reaching out to, to the 130 agencies as well, Debbie? Uh, through the chair, once this passes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. That's all I, the assurance I need is if we're referring back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna put my, oh, Councillor Pauls. Thank you. Debbie, can I ask you a question? Uh, with the Presso card, then you could use any transit, right? TTC, ESS, and... So through the chair, uh, every transit agency in the GTHA, and if you get to Ottawa, they are also on the Presto card. Okay. Uh, I w I'm seeing the new product, mobile ticketing, that you could buy it on the, your smartphone, right? So through the chair, with the new equipment that we are currently... Um, testing right now from Presto. Uh, it does have the ability for future proofing and different functionality, which potentially uh, will accommodate mobile ticketing. So in response to the requirement to have that plastic Presto card forever in a day, there are going to be additional options available through the new Presto equipment. But that you know, is further down uh, the road in regards to how they're rolling out the uh, new functionality. Okay, um, I had a, a real bad experience. I don't know if I, I went from uh, Burlington to Toronto on the TCC, and we bought a ticket there, and it was because I'm a senior. Well, guess what? It was only $6, it was $12 for both of us. Now, coming back, my husband did it on the phone, and I didn't, we did not know. It's every half hour, so... We saw the train, but we wanted to get a coffee. So we said, well, you think we'll make it? We didn't know, we got a coffee, and the train was still there. We pressed the button, because they give you five minutes to get, it's a timer, five minutes, and then you could go on the train. We didn't know that, so we put the five minutes. When we got in the uh, train, there was nobody except four uh, ticket officers. We sat right beside them. We didn't think anything of it. We got a $200 ticket. I was shocked, $100 each, because it was one minute and 39 seconds left. So I said to the ticket, there's nobody here. I said, we didn't know. We, did, we were gonna wait a half hour. We would have to wait a half hour 
before we could go in until that five minutes was expired. We did not know that. So I said, do you think there's nobody in the train? Do you think I would sit beside you if I knew that? We were so proud to say, here, we bought our tickets. And they said, no, you still have a minute and 39 seconds. You can't come on the train. So you said, you want us to go out and wait half hour? He said, well, you should have pressed the, uh, the button. You have to read the instruction. Well, I was taken back. So I wrote to them and I said, no wonder, you know, <laughs> people are scared to maybe do this Presto card. I didn't, it wasn't a Presto, I bought it on, my husband bought it on the phone. So I just a little bit confused. I really am. What, did you know that? So through the chair, um, I'm not up to speed on all the rules and regulations for Go <laughs> exactly. Transit. Um, we, we're different here in, in, as a regional, as a, um, uh, conventional bus service because mm -hmm. people just tap on. It's not a, you know, uh, uh, people just tapping on or not tapping on and, and, and uh, not the honor system, but, you know, waiting the only time that potentially you, you know, maybe um, found to not have paid affairs when they come around to check. Whereas on a bus, you're tapping your card on and there's an operator right there to verify that you do in fact have the proper fares. But so. I'm asking, if somebody gets a Presto card, they could use it for the TTC, right? So through the chair, that's correct. The that's Presto correct. card is, is usable at every transit right. agency in the GTHA. So I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I was so discouraged, you know, when we got those tickets and I, I just couldn't, I said, let me understand this. I paid my ticket, but they said that's how it works. So there's a lot of things that, um, people don't know about the, you know, the system. And I think it to be more clear, we need to know more. So I'm uh, with Councillor um, Vanderbeek that we need to refer it back. Okay. Councillor Pearson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, certainly appreciate Councillor Paul's raising this point because I wasn't aware of that. So I do want to ask because our ticket system is a bit different because we have the transfers. So recognizing we have, if you get on a bus, you have, and you get off and you want to transfer, we won't be getting a transfer anymore. That's on the Presto card. So what happens when you transfer to the next bus, and I know there's a two hour limit, how would you know whether you're, obviously, whether you've made it in that two hour limit? So through the chair, um, there's a display on the actual machine on the bus that tells you that you're within the two hours or you're not within the two hours. So you would know before, it, when you just put your Presto card there and you say you didn't want to go on, then you'd come off the bus or you didn't have the fare to carry on? I'll defer to the yeah. expert on the functionality. Uh, okay, Nancy. thank you. Uh, so through the chair, um, when, you, when you board a bus and you, and you tap the device at the front of the bus, it will automatically recognize whether a transfer is valid or not. Um, it, there's you can't actually step off the bus. You're, so it you automatically fare. takes a fare like, off. It will take a fare if you're outside of the two hours. Provided you have that on the card. If not, then you'd have to leave, correct? So through, through the chair, there's a couple of things. So um, if your card is registered and um, you're out of funds, it will still allow you to ride to complete your final trip. Okay. Um, and then you can load funds, you know, in, while you're in progress or when you get home. Um, or if you don't have any money left, the operator, depending on who you are, time of day, may ask you to leave. Okay. Thank you for that. I have a couple questions. All my vice chairs and previous chairs have left, so who wants to? <laughs> Councillor Nan. Floor um, yours. Thank you. Um, so on the question of timing, our next public works meeting is until the end of March. Is there any concern in terms of timing for deferring this? So through the chair, um, we did uh, set out the timing to allow enough time for the transition. So we would be encroaching on that time and we were trying to coordinate that with uh, potentially uh, should we get approval for year five the, through the budget process that the fares would be going up in September. So we were trying to coordinate everything with that one change happening in September. 
So um, depending on uh, when we would come back, uh, if it's council's desire to still allow that same amount of time between uh, uh, where we are today and retiring the fair media, then we would have to adjust those timelines. And um, is, is, is that is it encroaching, is it still possible? Just, I just wanna make sure if we do defer this that we don't run into something else. So through the chair, uh, you know, that, that'll be approximately two months that we've lost in this transition pro uh, uh, pro program. And like anything with change, uh, you know, you want to take your time and get the communication out there and, and ensure that uh, everybody's aware. And uh, so it, it will be challenging um, given the timing. So I, I'm prepared to move forward with what we have today and then work on a, a compassionate grant or something in the future. Um, I see this as we purchase a number of, yeah, well, the referral motion also has an action on it. Um, so, where was I? That you're prepared <laughs> to move forward with what's here and a compassion grant so later. To, to work on these in, in separate paths. So I see this as our goal is still to get to 80% presto adoption. We need to get there in order to realize the savings and uh, that's part mm -hmm. of our contractual, contractual obligation to get to 80% and then separately, I kind of see it as we purchase a number of presto cards that we can then hand out if people on a needs base, if they need a card and not uh, consider the paper tickets anymore. So I think that those can be done separately. So I'm not gonna support uh, a referral back. I'm prepared to move forward with this, but we will put that to a vote. And with that, I'll take the chair back. Okay, so on the motion, Councillor Vanderbeek, can you just read out the final direction? Thank you, Mr. Um, Deputy Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Terry Whitehead, that item 10.4 be referred back to staff to report at the next public works meeting on the feasibility of providing an eligibility criteria and cost of funding the initial um, uh, $6 Presto card for Hamilton residents who qualify in addition to the current, in, in addition to the current provisions in report PW 17033E. So the motion's on the floor, Councillor Whitehead. I, I you know, credit due, Councillor Clark, I did say ditto because he uh, very eloquently identified the issue and concern. I certainly with withdraw, I prepared to withdraw my seconding and allow him if he wishes to do so. Oh, okay, well, thank you for that. Okay, so on the motion, Councillor Nan. Thank you, through the chair. Um, so I'm uh, trying to find a solution moving forward given the issues that we're trying to address specifically while also enabling the work that needs to move forward moving forward. And um, I guess my hesitancy is the qualification piece because it's going to be further stigmatizing for residents to have to prove their qualification. Um, the, you know, basically we're asking residents to demonstrate their need to have the $6 covered versus um, working on a policy approach uh, to help mitigate the transition period for those who need it the most. Um, so I feel there may be a need, there, perhaps there's another solution we could come forward with an opportunity to move forward what we need to to be uh, aligned with our 80% targets while also taking care of the issue, which is the accessibility during the transition period. For those residents who cannot afford the $6 Presto card, that $6 would otherwise go towards two fares uh, on a paper ticket right now. So um, um, I don't have a solution necessarily, but uh, perhaps Councillor Vanderbeek does. Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, as long as my seconders um, agreeable, I'll take the word eligibility out of there. So there'll still be some criteria. They can go back with some criteria, whatever that is, and it may be that they div div decide how that's going to be just um, implemented after the fact. I just really want to make sure that those people are looked after before we agree or disagree with what goes, what is here today. I'd like to have it included in there. So I will take the word eligibility out. Would that work for you? I don't know, I don't know how you can do it without some criteria. 
Would you like to read it one more time, Councillor Vanderbeek? So, uh, sorry, what did you want me to do? Read it out with oh, the read it without the word? Sure. That item 10.4 be referred back to staff to report at the next public works meeting on the feasibility of providing a criteria and cost of funding for the um, funding the initial $6 Presto card for Hamilton residents who qualify in addition to the current provisions in report PW 17033E. Thank you. Okay. Councillor, did you wish to speak to it further? Oh, I'll keep. I don't know, I'm sort of looking over there to see list. if that satisfies. We're good. So are you okay? Because you're the you. seconder. Okay. Councillor Whitehead. We got Councillor Collins there, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, um, you know, I, I advertised my cell phone and thought people thought it was crazy uh, by advertising my ward and thought it would be abused by constituents and I can tell you, it does not get abused. Those people that need to use it, use it. Uh, so when I said that I don't know if eligibility would be a high requirement from me, my perspective in this kind of format, I meant that. I, I don't, I really believe that the people that really need it other people will be uh, uh, utilizing it, and we can monitor that. Uh, I just don't see it. And I'll give you another example. We created a, a daycare program and funded it uh, through uh, social services, and thought it was a great idea to help uh, on the social services side, and no one using it. No one used it, so we end up limiting the, the program. So I, 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 I am somewhat half full uh, cup here that we don't have to put any uh, things that diminish uh, the empowerment of individuals in our community to have access to a fund that uh, uh, could offset their, their need. Uh, so I just want to put that on record that I think we can get away with it and I don't think it would be abused, but we can monitor it and if it is, then we could change it up. Councillor Collins. Thanks, I was gonna ask uh, that, I believe these savings were already incorporated into the 2020 budget process. So I would like Mike, I know it's a guess right now in terms of not knowing where it's going to go as it relates to assistance to people who may need it, but we should be aware of the financial implications at our next budget meeting. So if that can just be incorporated into a future presentation, I would appreciate it. Chairman. So, yep. Sorry, through, through the chair, these, these savings have not been incorporated yet as we're still currently right now, we're still expending them. Uh, so it will be once, once um, this is approved and we move forward, we'll re realize the savings. And General Manager McKinnon would like to add something. Yeah, and th thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and maybe I'll, I'll call on Nancy again for this. The, there is another risk associated with this, and it has to do with the software program that's necessary for issuing the paper media. And maybe I could just ask Nancy to articulate the uh, kind of the, the, the health of that system right now. Uh, so through the chair, the current system, as I you know mentioned it in the report, is eight years past its... Um, useful life, uh, so it's wrapped in a lot of bandages right now, um, and there's there's very little that we can do. It's the system is designed to uh, manage all of our inventory for tickets and passes. Um, it, you know, it allows us to package and sell product to vendors, calculate commissions for them, accept refunds, uh, sell to the general public. Um, this, this software is, um, it's, it's actually very important for the business as it stands today. Um, and if that business continues to stand, I really need to start looking at uh, purchasing additional software, which we estimate will be $500,000. Okay, so I, I think that if I'm going back now to the report of Public Works, the original one, it was a 2021 savings because it was a mid-year change. So if there are capital then implications for this year, we've already passed capital, then Mr. Zagarek or others can let us. Thank you. Councillor Vanderbeek, I believe you'd be third time. So I'm gonna to go to Councillor Nan and then I'll come back to you for the last word. Does that work? Councillor Nan. Thank you through the chair. Um, so if doing away with the paper ticket is required in order to uh, not upgrade a bandage system that we're preparing prepared to take offline. Uh, I think the, the comment or the, the, the issue that we're trying to address is finding a way to support residents who need it to access a free Presto card so that they can continue using the system and that we're meeting our targets for the 80% 
presto adoption. So we're enabling residents to be able to participate in that and then uh, also um, not have to have the burden of the $6 get in the way of having two fares. So that, that would be my recommendation moving forward. Councillor Vanderbeek. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I just want to assure you that this motion does not involve paper tickets whatsoever. It is a way to allow people to continue to pay the same price they're paying now and not suffer the, the uh, consequence of trying to come up with $6 for the card initially. So they would get the card for free and then they would be able to put their, let's say they want two trips, they'd be able to put their $5 on it and do their two trips at the same price they're paying now, which is the ticket price, but it's not involving paper tickets. That's a Thank you. valuable clarification. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clark? I want to thank Councillor Vanderbeek and Councillor Whitehead for moving the motion. I, I think the, the committee is going to, to support it. I'm not trying to, to be the cog in the wheel that causes problems, but if we're creating special paper tickets that we're going to provide them to social agencies, then why couldn't we figure out a way to make sure that those special tickets are also going to the poor who are not connected to those agencies. So that's the one-off. Clearly there's a way, there's gotta be a way of fixing that to, to solve the problem. And the other side is Councillor Vanderbeek's motion with regards to the card. We just have to be cognizant that the people who really are needing transit aren't finding themselves in a situation where their costs are going up dramatically because Presto doesn't like the way we're doing business. And so I think this is a reasonable approach. Let's see if we can explore options and come back with solutions. And I appreciate the, 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 the latitude of the committee today. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion is on the floor. Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor. Thank you. And then on... Sorry, Madam Clerk, but the, with the report, would that be, oh no, it's deferred. So we're done with 10-4, correct? All right. So moving on to motions. Councillor Jackson, we have item 11.1, .1, the Huntington Park Recreation Center phase two renovations and expansion. Please introduce your motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I hope this is less acrimonious. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Ward 7 Councillor Esther Pauls. Whereas the Huntington Park Rec Center is an important part of the East Mountain community, provides many services, programs to its residents. Whereas a citizens committee was formed and has been in place the last couple of years to discuss renovations and expansion at the Huntington Park Center. Whereas life, life cycle renewal at the center is forecast in the 10 year council approved capital budget, whereas there's further opportunity to improve accessibility at Huntington Rec Center, and whereas there's been a program need identified to improve multifunctional youth and senior spaces, therefore be resolved, A, staff complete a feasibility study on the cost and scope of renovations and expansion at Huntington Rec Center, including engagement with the Citizens Committee, and B, that this long numbered uh, report of the Huntington Park feasibility study be funded at an upset limit of 100,000 from the Ward 6 discretionary funding project. And just to add further, Mr. Chairman, Huntington was on our list of about 41 rec centers, arenas, um, museum facilities that several months ago this council submitted uh, under the Federal Provincial Infrastructure Program for consideration. So it just adds a little authenticity further. And my Citizens Committee of Volunteers working with staff in my office for a couple of years are doing a great job, but we just need this additional funding to help uh, hire a design and consultant to help move us forward potentially. Seconded by Councillor Pauls, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So the motion is before you, all in favor. Thank you. 11.2 is uh, Alexander Park Play structural replacement. Councillor Nan. Thank you through the chair. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Farr. This is on behalf of Councillor Wilson. 
uh, whereas the play structure and safety surfacing at uh, Alexander Park, located at 201 Whitney Avenue, Hamilton has reached its end of life cycle and has become worn out. And whereas the current capital budget allows for a straight replacement of the structure and the community would like to see a larger enhanced amenity, therefore be it resolved that $50,000 be funded through the Ward 1 Capital Infrastructure Reserve to enhance the 2020 proposed capital replacement of the Alexander Park play structure and with any unspent funds to be returned to the Ward 1 Capital Infrastructure Reserved and that be the mayor and city clerks be authorized and directed to execute any required agreements and ancillary documents with such terms and conditions in a form satisfactory to our city solicitor. Thank you, so moved by Councillor Nan, seconded by Councillor Farr, all in favor? Thank you. Um, item 11.3, Councillor Marula is Chuck to Cartman. So is there anybody that would like to, Councillor Collins? Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Jackson. You have it in front of you for your consideration. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead? Okay, all in favor on 11.3? Thank you. On notices of motion, um, Councillor Nan, I believe you have two notices of motion. I'll come to you uh, after notices of motion, Councillor, does that work? Uh, I would go to Councillor, uh, it's under general information, so I would go to Councillor Ferguson first. Okay, Councillor Nan. Thank you. Uh, so it's a notice of motion and both the notices of motions remain as notices of motion. There's no need to waive the rules. Uh, they're before you. They're both related to tree planting. Uh, one is around Powell Park tree planting. Um, this is about supplying and installing 780 millimeter shade trees to the existing landscape of Powell Park at a cost of $8,000 to be funded through Ward 3 area rating discretionary account and that the consultation be that consultation with residents of the ward take place prior to the placement and see that it be done in a way that's uh, required um, in terms of all of our legal uh, needs. And then the second notice of motion is a private tree giveaway for Ward 3. Uh, it's before you as well. And both of these are through Ward 3 area rating discretionary accounts. And we will um, uh, vote on them, I guess, at the next PW meeting, thank you. Thank you, so those are being left as notices of motion. So no further uh, action here. So moving on to, is there any other notices of motion? Seeing none. So moving on to item 13 is the general information and outstanding business. 13.1 is the uh, amendments to the outstanding business list. Is there any discussion? Nope, moved by Councillor Pearson. Seconded by Councillor Jackson. Madam Clerk, is there anything that was withdrawn on the outstanding? I don't think so. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, not to my knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, that was moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All in favor? No, it's electronic vote. And then Councillor Ferguson, you have a, a motion, I believe. Councillor Ferguson, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is something I've been working on for quite some time. and. Um, as most of you probably know, I'm appointed by council to, to be the council rep on the Royal Botanical Gardens Board of Directors. And on December 17th, um, the board and all the senior staff went out off-site for an all-day meeting on a 30-year strategic plan. And uh, one of the presentations done by their consultants, MT Planners, which is an international consultant on uh, gardens and landscapes, uh, presented a solution to uh, clean up Shit Oak Creek. It's something they've been looking at for quite a while. And of course, this is after decades of contamination. As you probably all know by now, the Conservation Authority, the uh, BARC, 
uh, our own staff and the RBG get copies of the test results that are taken and, and a report is, is sent out to all these agencies. And it didn't jump off the page when our gate was open by 5% that there was a problem because the E. coli level in Shell Creek has been astonishingly high for decades for a number of reasons. It, uh, the 403 drains into it, all the storm sewers on the West Mountain, including Ancaster, but at the West Mountain, all drain into Shadow Creek and end up in Coots Paradise. And so uh, when the um, presentation was done by the consultant, it was quite a comprehensive presentation, my antennas went up. And I said I'd love to have uh, that consultant do a presentation before our public works committee uh, to see the solution that they're proposing. And with that, it got a, an applause from the board. So they're anxious that city council see it. It was my interpretation of that. So just to be careful, I wanted to make sure that what the, the consultant was suggesting would work. I, so, uh, I set up a meeting here in our uh, city hall council's boardroom on January the 22nd. And I invited um, our own public works staff, our, director, our general manager of public works and our director of water wastewater. There was two staff from the RBG, uh, Tice, and his last name just escapes me, but he's in charge of all their natural areas. And um, the consultant, his name is Drew Winsley from PT Planners. And at that preliminary meeting, all uh, agreed that this could be a solution. So I tried to get that planner to come before and do the presentation of planning committee because um, I thought it'd be great for you to see it. However, we've had real trouble getting schedules sorted out. We went through Christmas, then we went through other public works meetings up until today where we couldn't get our schedules lined. And we finally uh, came to a consensus we can't do that and I wanted to get it before the committee. So I'd like now just to show you some pictures of what they proposed. Yeah, I just got a friend, oh, right there. This is a picture of the mouth of Shadow Creek. And this was taken in July of, uh, or the summer of 2019, so last summer. This would have been a year after the gate was closed at our combined sewer overflow tank. And it was after the heavy rains that we had and snow in the winter and, and spring of 2019, which of course resulted uh, in lake levels rising to record levels. And so it struck me when I saw this, if I can make this work, there it is. This is the mouth, and you can see it going out into Coots Paradise, and you can just see the color of the water that's coming down on Shadow Creek from all the drainage upstream. And once again, I want to stress, this was a year after the gate had been closed, and probably all the, the uh, discharge from that open gate had been washed out into Coots Paradise, and ultimately on, I guess, into the harbor and into Lake Ontario. So it struck me that we have a much bigger problem than just the gate being open to the 5%. Let's see if I can run this thing. So this was uh, something that was proposed by the consultant. It's a project he did in Saudi Arabia, and it's called bioremediation. Uh, so it's a natural process where they use plant material and putting oxygen in the water of a way to uh, get the water suitable, similar to what we do at our own sewage treatment plants, a similar process is by pumping in oxygen, rolling the water around before it's discharged into Shadow Creek. Now, that picture is very hard to explain, but uh, it's an idea of what this setup is. This is a picture of the, the consultant from Toronto on the left, sitting with his client in Saudi Arabia, taking a look at the stream that remediated, and his client said they'll never get the public to come back into there. There's a picture of the public of how they're coming back and it's now become a recreation center for them. There's another picture. Look at all the cars coming in and starting to use something that was a cesspool, a good, great word, turned into a recreation center by putting this bioremediation, bio, bio sorry, I had to just think about that for a second, in place for this creek in Saudi Arabia. Now this is a much bigger installation, of course, than what uh, uh, we would do at Shadow Creek here in Hamilton. But it shows that they have worldwide experience in doing this and they've had great success at it. So this is a busy slide, but I thought I would show it to you. And by the way, this is the presentation given to us. 
I'm only putting up four slides for you today to get a feel to it because my intent here is just to refer this back to staff to meet with our BGA, our BG staff and refer back to us or come back to us. But uh, they start by putting this, they take up the shoreline, uh, the, the roughness of it right here and replace it with a plant material. And then they also put floating material out here is floating wetland plots capture sediments, pollutants, and trap them in their root system. This is a rock system that's down here. And what it does, it turns the water over. Now, we have those in Red Hill Creek right now to turn the water over. And it's a way of getting oxygen back into the, uh, into the, uh, the water, which is important to sustain plant life and fish life downstream. And this right here is a fine bubble or aeration pipe network. Now that's the most expensive part of the system because you actually have to put force air and it runs 24 seven into the water to get more oxygen back in the water before it's, it's run through the plant system to capture all the pollutants and, and then it's discharged back into Coos Paradise when it's finished. So I tried to do a real short uh, version of this. As I say, I wish the consultant, I could have got the schedule organized to come here and explain it to you in detail. So what I have done, and uh, you know, the RBG uh, staff have a copy of this resolution, is that the general, it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek, that the general manager of public works and director of Hamilton Water, or their designates be authorized and directed to meet with Royal Botanical Gardens staff to review potential solutions to Shadow Creek and report back to the General Issues Committee. And the reason we're reporting back to General Issues rather than Public Works is that where this is where the Shadow Creek matter has been debated. So uh, Clerk said it should probably come back that report after they meet with uh, RBG staff and report back uh, to General Issues Committee. So that's all I'm asking for today. I wanted to let everyone know that this is out there. I want you know I found it very exciting when I saw it. There's a simple natural way to fix this problem. And not just from the leak of the, of the gate, but the ongoing pollution that's coming down Shadow Creek and contaminating Coots Paradise and creating a lot of problems from there. And uh, so I believe that uh, Dan already has a meeting set up with staff next week uh, with our BG staff to start this process. And I look forward to report coming back from both of them on whether this system is the right system for Shadow Creek to be able to fix this problem. So that's all I have at this time. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. So I need a mover and a seconder to receive the photos. Moved by Councillor Pauls, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. So then the motion, Councillor Ferguson, would be to, sorry, just read that. To refer it to the, the public work staff to meet with our BG staff and report back, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. Okay. So on the motion, Councillor Whitehead. Well, I want to thank uh, the good work of the uh, good Councillor Lloyd Ferguson on this file and what it has revealed is that we've laid on our, our sat on our hands too long in the context of the legacy issues that belong to that creek. Uh, never mind the incident, uh, clearly there's a legacy issue that uh, created high E. coli. I know that uh, Redeemer College identified uh, a lot of uh, issues coming off the Shadow Creek uh, in, into that stormwater system. So. Uh, it, it, it behooves us to to take a look at uh, new uh, technologies that could work in, and uh, I mean this. The goal to me is not to make this a swimmable creek, although that'd be you know be neat. But uh, it is actually uh, a, a make it a viable creek. And when I take a look at, uh, I just came from Elliott Lake, and Horn Lake was the Shadow Creek of Elliott Lake for the longest time because the uh, sewer system fed into the uh, into that lake. And when I was leaving uh, on this long weekend, they had uh, a derby on that, a fishing derby on that very lake, uh, a small lake, um, probably about 500 uh, to 1,000 people with their tents and their, 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 their little huts on the, on the lake. And I thought, well, what a turnaround. So here's a lake that you wouldn't even think of uh, uh, fishing on. It was a, a, recip a, reciprocal, a recipient of uh, stuff coming from the, the, sewer, the, the dated sewer plants. Uh, and now it's a viable uh, fishing uh, location and, 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 uh, and one of the largest Northern Ontario uh, fishing derbies is being held on that, on that particular lake. So uh, these things are possible and, uh, and I, I wanna thank Councillor Ferguson for uh, uh, 
addressing the legacy piece on this on this piece because I think that is important. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Can you just take the chair for one moment? I have a couple brief comments. So, just want to thank Councillor Ferguson for breaking up uh, such a novel solution. It is uh, really interesting to see what is being done in other uh, communities. Um, and Councillor Whitehead on on the issue of legacy in Shadow Creek. I think, for me anyway, if if we're looking at solutions, I'm I'm a little bit skeptical of looking at what is an end of pipe solution and not looking at the watershed in terms of Shadow Creek. That's the watershed on, on the West Mountain. The majority of the upper Shadow Creek watershed is in Ward 8 um, and, and Ancaster, as, as the councillor indicated, um, you know, so that people can go to Shadow Falls, which is upstream and not be contaminated by human feces, that we fix the underlying problems. And, and I think that when the consultants were here, the, their recommendation was um, that we not dredge, that uh, if we were to clean up Shido, the bottom of Shadow Creek, the end, and also Coots, that is just gonna be recontaminated because we're not fixing the underlying problem. So uh, I definitely am really interested to see what uh, will come out of proposing this with, uh, with the RBG, but just to not lose track of the watershed approach here, and also the fact that if we are proposing these kinds of solutions, that they're gonna cost money. And uh, looking at, uh, again, stormwater management fees as a way to fix the underlying problems and fund stormwater management uh, solutions down the road because we can't look at those in, in isolation. So thank you, I will take the chair back. And Councillor Whitehead. The response because what you don't know uh, probably, and that's uh, saying that with, uh, with the greatest respect, is that uh, our, our uh, water, wastewater uh, people after Redeemer did the original, uh, uh, found, had the re original finance to Creek and found high E. coli, did extensive uh, research. In fact, I remember uh, I had a rat problem because uh, they were smoking a lot of the pipes uh, to determine uh, some of the, the, uh, the, the bad hookups uh, to, to, to ensure that people were adhering to the, the code and, and that uh, the sewer was going where it's supposed to go. And I was told that uh, it was highly successful over that period of time in Ward 8 in the context of identifying a, a number of those uh, bad hookups and having them corrected. I was also told subsequent uh, and subsequent tests that we still get high O. coli and I've been told that a lot of it is natural occurring. So uh, we have to accept the fact that it's, you're getting a lot of storm water from the mountain and there's some things you can't control. Uh, so certainly the stuff coming off the, uh, the uh, Lincoln Alexander, the stuff the coming off of uh, the, the uh, 403, uh, there, there are limitations even to engineering, uh, unless you want to spend an absolute fortune. So I think uh, when you look at these issues, you have to look not just at from source, uh, because you under, need to understand your capacity, limitations and cost, but you need to look at it comprehensively right from the source to the, the end, and I think this is a solution that helps balance the things that we can't control at the source. Councillor Ferguson? Yeah, and I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, the right thing to do is to fix upstream. However, I know that Public Works for the last three years have been blowing smoke up the uh, sanitary sewer pipe in Ancaster trying to find cross connections and then run around and look for smoke to come out eave troughs, which means eave, the eave troughs are connected to the sanitary sewer. So they've attempted, they've done their best to try to fix the upstream problem, but you'll never be able to fix the runoff in the 403. And it drains a large area coming all the way down the escarpment. And all the oil and other stuff that could fall off vehicles and trucks. And also what gets on our city streets and gets washed into catch basins. There's no easy solution for that. This does not have to be installed at the, at the mouth of Shadow Creek. It can be installed further upstream. In fact, I think that would be the intent to probably take it back where the CSO tanks are. We still have an overflow in that CSO tank, and so you want to make sure you're downstream from that in the event that our staff have to open up in the, in the case of a very large storm. And then it can, uh, this can help capture some of that material that's coming out and, and, and treat it in a natural way, which is one of the part that really caught my attention. So I look forward to our staff meeting with their staff and staying in touch with them and seeing a report back. Great, thank you, councillors. So the motion is on the floor, moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All in favor? Thank you. 
And Councillor Whitehead, did you have other business that? And, and, uh, and I think it would be a question that would be appropriate at any committee because when you look at selections, which I sit on, uh, and on all the citizens' committees, um, they impact almost every standing committee. So the question I have is, uh, in the era of impeachment, uh, what is the processes or are there processes in place uh, if uh, you have someone on a committee that is a non-performer or breaking in breach of code of conduct or in breach of other uh, statutory uh, regulations and policies, is there a process in which we have in place that they can be removed? Uh, I'm not sure there's anybody here that can answer that. Okay, I'm raising it now and I'll be pursuing it. The Thank governance you. issue. Thank you. Um, I do have a request for Madam Clerk. So earlier in the meeting there was um, a point of privilege, I believe it was, that if your name that automatically provides the name council the privilege to respond immediately. Um, my understanding of the Benoit's rules of order and our governance bylaw that that's not a point of privilege. So I'm standing by my ruling, but I would appreciate an official interp interpretation from clerks um, to you know sort that out because it has come up at a number of times at different uh, different committee meetings and at council. Thank you. Well, I'd like an official opinion on that, if that would be possible. So through you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify, are you asking me to define point of privilege? No, on the, on the issue where if a counselor is named that they automatically have a point of privilege to respond immediately. That was, that was the issue from earlier today. But I, I can take that offline and, and ask uh, in, uh, through clerks. Councillor Whitehead? Just on that, there's two things you gotta look at. You have to look at a procedural bylaw, you gotta look at past practice, and you gotta look at the Borneo, uh, uh, Borneo's, uh, uh, so it's, it's the construct of all three uh, experiences at this horseshoe, and it has been the practice that once you're named, you have the ability to speak. Now, the differential is when the original speaker concludes their comments is when you have the right to enter into the, the privilege not during the period of time where that person has the floor. So you would, have, you would be the next speaker automatically on the, on the list as a result of the, the privilege. So that was the only nuance that wasn't uh, exercised. Thank you. Okay, no further business. Adjournment moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Ferguson. All in favor? Carried.